I got to testify in front of Congress. Uh, I'll actually probably never do that again. That was an interesting experience. Uh, but uh, working with uh, that type of, uh, of interesting things, not, not for me, I guess. Uh, but I'm on the news a lot and all those other things. And I run two companies uh, that are specifically dedicated to protecting organizations. So we have a 24-7 security operations center of hackers looking for hackers and trying to bust uh, other hackers breaking into computer systems, as well as folks that, that break into some of the most te technologically advanced uh, computer systems out there. I also run a hacker conference. Believe it or not, there's conferences dedicated to hackers. Um, and we all converge, and this one's in Louisville, Kentucky, but there's a big one in Vegas called DEF CON with 20,000 hackers where we share our exploits and our attacks and how we're getting into computer systems and try to get things to, to, be, uh, to better, uh, better the, the, uh, the world. And so if you look at, at what we deal with today, um, I started you know, essentially a company out of my basement, and I grew uh, to well over 200 people uh, doing work globally uh, in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the world. And uh, what's interesting to see what's happening out there is that the world is changing so fast. We use technology to start up our businesses, to augment. We go to the cloud uh, to, to be able to support our business objectives. We use information uh, from the internet. I mean, it's integrated into everything. I mean, we have you know, implantable devices in us now. We have smartphones. We have technology in our watches. I mean, we have you know, augmented reality. All of these things that are coming up. And if you're not uh, keeping up with things, machine learning and artificial intelligence is a whole new industry that's, that's booming out there around being able to calculate things faster, uh, autonomous cars, technology integrated into our cars ourselves. In fact, we do work for some of the largest uh, car manufacturers out there, and the whole purpose is taking cars apart to figure out how we can get them to drive off the road. Um, and, and obviously fix those, uh, we wanna fix those. Uh, but you know, if you look at how technology supports everything that we do, it's, it's everywhere. And so with that in our businesses and what we're dealing with on a regular day-to-day -day basis, it's important for us to protect. And so uh, let's take a little bit of a look around what's actually occurring out there. If you look at, at the, the hacker uh, demographics, there's a number of different hackers out there. You have organized crime, uh, you, mostly Eastern European, Russian descent uh, from that side. I'm sure everybody's heard of the terms ransomware. Uh, I'm sure of la as of last week or the week before, uh, the whole WannaCry thing where hospitals are being shut down, uh, that was an interesting uh, piece of it. Uh, you have that from an organized crime perspective, but you also have countries that are developing uh, sophisticated techniques around breaking into our own countries, get, grabbing our own intellectual property. We create trillions and trillions of dollars of intellectual property here inside the United States. And if countries can get that and get an edge on us when it comes to what we're building and how we're actually progressing in the market, they can go and do the same thing. We were dealing with uh, an, what we call an incident response recently, uh, where a nation state was hacking into a company in the manufacturing side and uh, basically stealing all their intellectual property for their next generation products so they can compete in our own market for a cheaper cost. Those are the things that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis um, as we go along in, in what we see. If you look at the news lately, has everybody heard of the term the equation group uh, and the shadow brokers? Um, those are two terms, uh, if you're not familiar, the equation group is the NSA uh, and shadow brokers are the Russian intelligence side. And what happened uh, most recently is that uh, the NSA lost a substantial amount of their, what we call their exploit kits. Um, it, allowed, it allows uh, the NSA to conduct cyber operations across the globe. And as part of that, they had basically a skeleton key for every single Windows machine out there. So they can essentially access any Windows machine they wanted to. Um, and the shadow brokers, Russia, um, got a hold of these and leaked them to the public. And so now you had all these exploits uh, out there in the wild. And so it caused mass pandemonium. When you heard WannaCry happen, that was actually from the NSA's leaked toolkits. So the, the mass worm that was replicating and shutting down hospitals actually originated from us. And, and taxpayers actually paid for that code to, to be developed. Now, that's the world we live in today. We have to have those capabilities because we are conducting operations against other countries that have those exact same capabilities as well. It'd be a great world if we're all like, okay, let's share the information and protect ourselves, but no one else is doing the same things. So we have to have those same types of capabilities. But it essentially means that you know, nation states have the ability to get into any computer system they want to at any given time, uh, which, is which is always uh, pretty interesting. But if you look at how we're hacking today, if you look at how Russia hacks, how China hacks, how Iran hacks, how North Korea hacks. And by the way, the WannaCry, does anybody know where it came from? Where did WannaCry originate from? Anybody know? North Korea. Kim Jong-un has a whole team dedicated to just making money for the regime. And WannaCry was ransomware. You paid to get your files back, right? And so he made about $200,000 off of that specific one. At least that's the general estimates in Bitcoin uh, at this point in time. Not a big, big bank, but uh, could have been much worse. If you look at how these, these countries are actually getting into organizations and how they're exploiting machines and getting access and what you see in the news, guess where it originates from? Us. People are the number one target 
when it comes to how we get access into computer systems. By opening up an email, by opening up a document, by going to a specific website, you have the ability to introduce an attacker into your, into your network. And think about it. You probably, even in, in, uh, in, in a small business organization, you probably have firewalls, right? You probably have systems that try to protect you. You probably have antivirus. Do we know the effectiveness of antivirus today? It can only detect about three to maybe 5% of what the actual viruses are out there today. So you have these capabilities, right? And you hope that you have these protections in place, but let me just paint a little picture. Let's consider your business a, a castle. You have a firewall that protects your castle, right? You have, uh, a, you, know, you have heavily stone walls and archers and moats and all these other things and intrusion prevention systems. And in this firewall, everything's protected. What happens when you get down past the drawbridge? You have a wide open area where you share information, you collaborate, your email servers, your instant messages, how you're, you're developing your, your, uh, your business. Everything that, that you hold you know, sensitive to your company is contained behind those walls. And if I hack you, where are you sitting at? Behind those walls. So there's no walls that are preventing us as hackers right now. That's why companies are really struggling with what we're identifying today is because hackers can break in to one individual and it's literally the downfall of an entire company. So that's the current state of security today. One person is the downfall of an entire company. It could be anybody in the company. It doesn't need to be somebody that is in your IT infrastructure. When I hack individuals, I go after sales folks. You can get them to do anything you want to. You're like, hey, I got a million dollars you need to spend by Friday. Can you open up this virus.exe? And they're like, sure, no problem. And you hack them, right? It's actually a true story, to be perfectly honest with you. It's the scary part about it, right? <laughs> But we are getting more sophisticated. And, and when I say the term hacker, hacker can be used for good and bad terms. But when I say the word hacker, we are getting better at what we're doing. We will send targeted attacks. We will you know, build information off of individuals and people, what you put on social media, what you do um, on, on, on your network. I was on the Katie Kirk, uh, Kirk show a couple years ago, and I actually hacked somebody live in the audience and uh, had hacked her home computer, enabled her webcam, was spying on her whole house uh, based on her, her Internet of Things devices. Uh, yeah, it terrified everybody, too, including my parents. Uh, <laughs> And then my mom's like, have you ever done that to me? I'm like, mom, I hacked your computer when I was like 13. You're fine. So, um, <laughs> but you know, what's, what's interesting and scary about the same part is that you know, a lot of folks don't understand uh, the awareness around how important it is not to open up things that you don't trust. As business owners, we try to open up everything because we want to move our businesses forward. But if you don't know where they're coming from, why even open it up in the first place? By opening up a document, a Word document, by opening up an Excel document, by going to a website you don't know, those three things can completely hack your computer without you even knowing about it completely. Enable your webcam. If you notice my computer has this nice little camera cover on it. People think that's stupid, but it actually does work. Believe me, I'm, I spy on people with their, their cameras. It does work. Just kidding. Kind of. <laughs> so if you look at, at why we can't catch them in this industry right now, it's because the people piece of it puts a whole different wrench in what we do. Uh, people are unpredictable. Uh, we just have to change our tactics and our techniques of going after an individual in order for us to be successful. And our patterns shift all the time. We're changing how we do things. It, it, you know, in the 90s, why antivirus was effective is because we were still using AOL, um, and there was only like, you know, like 100 hackers out there sending viruses out. Now we have millions and millions and millions of hackers all over the place writing different things, and there's no way for antivirus technology to actually keep up with what we're doing. So the emphasis right now in businesses and to protect your businesses from these things is education is, is key and, and, and paramount. Understanding what your threats are as a business. You know, it's no different than any other business risk that you deal with on a regular basis. This is just one thing you have to build in if you're doing technology and business. You have to do security as part of it. And you have to build your organization to, to be able to withstand those. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But what we do as hackers isn't magic. It's not magic, OK? It might seem like it. And I'm actually going to show you a little bit of magic here in just a second, right? Um, I like doing magic shows. I, when I was a kid, David Copperfield, he was flying around, and I, ever since then I became a hacker. I don't know why that happened. But, um, but what we do as hackers is not magic. We're very predictable in our patterns of how we go and do things. But you know, the information that we leave online makes things so much easier for us. I'm sure no one here has a LinkedIn profile at all, right? And I'm sure you don't list any of your experiences, your prior businesses, or anybody that you're friends with, or anything like that. And I'm sure we're not on Facebook or Twitter or social media. Things that we do on a regular basis, right? We become much more of an open culture. That's great for us as attackers, because I just sit there and I research somebody, and I build an attack off of their information that's already out there and available. Um, that's fun for us. So let's do a demonstration. I need somebody in the audience. Now, it, it, okay, come on up. Can we, <laughs> come on up. Can we, uh, can we mic her? Okay. Um, here, uh, steps right there. Here you go. All right, Carmen. Pleasure to meet you. Nice meeting you. Me 
a moment. You made your way on the stage. <laughs> now what I'm going to do, um, and I'm, and I'm going to show Carmen uh, this on the back side so you don't actually uh, uh, see any, any sensitive information. What I'm going to attempt to do is, I've never, Carmen, have I ever met you before? No. You raised your hand really fast though, that was impressive, so that was really good. <laughs> I've never met Carmen before. Um, are you from the United States? I am a resident here. You're a resident? Yeah. Okay. I'm we'll originally from Eastern Europe, so. That might be a little bit more difficult for me to find in a quick notice. We'll find out though. Um, but what we're going to try to do is pull some information uh, about Carmen um, on the public network uh, and see what we can find. Now, most of the time, I can pull social security numbers or public information, pre previous addresses, family members, uh, things like that. So we'll, we'll give it a shot. So do I have your permission to, to look? Go ahead. All right. Are you here in, the, uh, are you here in uh, New York? Do yes. you live in New York? Yes. Okay. Do you actually live in New York City? Um, no. Okay. So for time's sake, one second here. No, it might is com completely fail. You never know. We shall see. Let me validate my pen number here. Got to get access to my super secure system, which I have trouble getting into. I'm sure we all feel that way. And so, Carmen. And just uh, for sake of time, what, uh, what, uh, what's, what's your zip code that you live in? Just 10941. Middletown, got it. All right, let's take a look. Are you 28? Yes. OK. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, that was too personal. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, let's see what else we got there. Uh, Sheena. Is that your sister? Sister in law. Sister in law, okay. Arnold, father? In law. In law, okay. David? Brother in law. Brother in law, okay. Uh, let's see what else we got here. And David is not even on Facebook. <laughs> uh, cities. Uh, Bullville? Are you originally from there? Bullville, New uh, York? Or that's where my P.O. box is. OK. <laughs> Eric uh, and Lori? Yes. <laughs> is that your uh, social security number? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carmen. Appreciate it. Thank you. Give a round of applause, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That also wasn't the last four, by the way. That was the full Social Security number. I'm not gonna gonna half it a little bit there. I'm gonna go all the way. But uh, Carmen, thank you very much. Oh yeah, it's fine. Uh, they'll take it off. Uh, you can actually. They'll. Yeah. Here. I'll grab it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen. Oh, sorry, your hair's cut there. Uh oh. All right, there you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Again, let's give a round of applause for Carmen for coming up here. And by the way, that information has been scrubbed. It's not going to be uh, used in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and I can get that in anybody here in the audience, so it's not a big deal. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> and your companies, for that matter. So you know. So breaking into stuff is easy, right? Because you know, there's so much information out there for us. Um, it's, it's possible for us to essentially do anything. Physical security, by far, is the easiest for us. We just impersonate anybody we want to. It's best is if you dress in a suit. Put on your phone and you act like you're busy. Walk into any building you want to, including some of the most secure places. Uh, I've actually, I won't even talk about that one, actually. Uh, so we'll tell you. <laughs> some fun tricks. Oh, that's, a, yeah, that's one. One second here. Hopefully it plays. Come on. Here we go. I've got to find where the mouse is at. I'm, I can hack into computer systems, but apparently I can't uh, play a video. All right, hang on a second. I'll fix this. All right, so just look up here really quick. I'll hit play. So in these cases, um, doors have sensors. And in sensors, uh, when, you, when you open up a door building that's locked, you can actually use e-cigarettes to trigger the motion sensors on the other side to open up the doors for you. I don't smoke, by the way, but I always carry an e-cigarette with me, uh, just to make sure. It's actually in my bag right now. I broke into like three places when I was coming here. But 
So you open up a door that way, right? <laughs> so you ever need to get into a bank? I was actually a funny story. Uh, I was breaking into a bank. <laughs> And uh, um, I've been wanting to do this e-cigarette trick for, for such a long time. I've been like, like it's going to work. It's going to work. I've tested it out. This is where I tested it out on. Uh, this is at a hotel. Um, and so I'm like, all right, I'm going to test it out. So I go to this bank, and it's like 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm like in all black. You know, I got throat mics. We're communicating with my other guy. You know, we're breaking into this bank building. And our whole goal is to get to this vault and get to the vault and then, you know, break into the vault and then take the money out, take pictures, and then put the money back, unfortunately. Um, but we got into this bank, and we're at the front door. And I'm sitting there for like five minutes blowing smoke into this, this, this door trying to trigger this motion sensor to work. We had already disabled the security system, actually did this time. Um, and one of my other folks, um, uh, Ben, which is right there, he, he's actually like 37, looks like he's like 14. Um, <laughs> but uh, Ben was, was, was going around the building to see if there's any other, other ways into there. So I'm out there for like 10 minutes now at this point, blowing smoke in this, and I finally get it to work, and I'm so excited. And I walk in, and Ben's sitting there on the counter, like, <laughs> laughing at me. And I'm like, Ben, how did you get in? Did you use the, the, the cigarette trick somewhere else? And he's like, no, nah, man, the side door was open. They forgot to lock it. I'm like, all right. Uh, if you ever need to get into a bank with whiskey, this is my good buddy, Deviant. Got motion sensors on the top. Or you can just dress up in suits and, and pretend that it's someone's birthday. That's Biebs. Looks like Justin Bieber. And then this is us actually walking into the building. And walking past. While, the, while they're doing the balloons, we walk right into the building, and then we plug into the network, and we hack and steal all their data. So physicals can definitely be um, pretty easy. But there is some good news in all of this, OK? There is good news. The good news is there's a whole class of us out there, hackers. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. I'm using uh, uh, someone else's computer, and uh, when I hit the up arrow, it takes like 30 seconds to respond. So, uh, um, but uh, the good news is there's a whole class of hackers out there that are designed to try to figure out what's happening in the industry and try to protect folks. Everything from when you saw the WannaCry stuff happen. When, when WannaCry was happening, does everybody know how that got stopped and why it wasn't so catastrophic as we thought it was going to be? So one guy bought the website. Yep. A 22-year-old kid out of the UK was trying to help. 22 years old. Was trying to help, and he was taking a look at the malware and saw that when, when it was launching, it was going out to a website that, that wasn't registered. And it was an accident. He, he registered the domain name to trying to figure out the website to see how many people were getting inf infected by WannaCry. And what the hackers had actually done is built in protection mechanisms against security defenses. And it said, if this website is up, shut yourself down because we think we're inside of what's called a sandbox, something that, that is looking for us to see if we're bad or not. And so it was a way of defeating um, the security techniques that we use today. But this 22-year-old registered this domain name. And so what happened is when the virus called out to say, hey, are you up and running? Is this website up and running? Am I inside of a sandbox? It's like, yep, the website's up and running. It actually stopped catastrophic loss across the world. And literally here in the United States, he found it just before we went into work here in the United States. So there's a whole group of us dedicated out there trying to protect folks against these types of things that are happening. And believe me, when, when WannaCry happened, it was on a Thursday night, of course. I didn't sleep all of Friday. I happened to go on a, another news organization at like, like 5 o'clock in the morning. I hadn't slept for two days, so I had like bags underneath my eyes. And you know, I had the, the suit on, but I was wearing gym shorts. Um, and I did the Charles Barkley. Uh, that's how it works. Um, but those types of things are things that we're trying to, to defend against. There's a whole group of us out there for it. Here's something that I did on over 20,000 hackers in one Here's place. something I did on on uh, Defcon's uh, the perfect venue for Discovery them to prepare Channel. for an upcoming bank hack in Beirut, Lebanon. So my good friends Jason. I mean, what's up? I thought what's you could up? break into anywhere. You couldn't even get in our own oh, door. Screw you, man. <laughs> screw you. The beauty of this community is that I don't know all this in this one field, but I've got a friend who does. So what do you need? What do you want? Yeah, so we're doing a bank job, and we're, gonna, we're going all the way. Like, So we're going to do the full penetration testing, yeah. everything, and full social engineering. Well, good news is I have uh, an unpublished version of the social engineering toolkit uh, where I just rewrote um, all the PowerShell injection techniques.
I had a new one uh, I did recently with it. So security guards, um, you know, have their phones next to them. Right. So I spoofed a text message to the security guard, letting him know that there was an issue outside. He went outside, and then I broke into the building that way. So it works really well. That's so it's right so great. Down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is sweet and scary. What's up, dude? Dude. Of all the hackers here, few know tech better than Darren Kitchen. We know you have some new stuff right. that's coming out. So He's one patented one of the most potent devices now in use and brought several that aren't even on the market yet. So if you need to do any uh, wireless on this engagement, this guy, Pineapple. So it's on right now. My phone's connected to it. Check this out. So someone's turn already off, Turn off your Wi-Fi. <laughs> Everybody turn off everything now. Everybody turn off your wi you guys. But yeah, check this out. So we've got basically everyone in the vicinity. Oh my gosh. Right? So basically, man, this is a, a malicious access point. Think right. about it from this factor. You know, people go to Starbucks all the time. They go right. to hotels. Right. When they join those networks, your computer records those settings. So right. next time you power your computer on, it's like, hey, is Starbucks here? Hey, is this hotel here? And that intercepts that and says, yep, always, I'm yep, Starbucks, me. connect to me. So if I was a bad guy, I could actually uh, manipulate the, the websites they go to. Yeah. Now you're the man in the middle. So I could create a fake web page that looks like Facebook, or it'll look like uh, the homepage for Google or Gmail, it'll look like the homepage for several banks, and make you put in your user ID and password there, and you think you're going to the legitimate site. Yeah, but they don't even realize it. So we're, yeah, we're definitely going to use that. Yeah. So you guys going to get physical access to any of these machines? We're planning, well, if, even if you only have a few seconds, I brought you some ducky payload. So what's nice about this one uh, specifically is uh, um, if you actually watch the whole show, um, we, we basically armed Jason uh, with enough stuff and Khalil, good buddies of mine, um, and they went to Lebanon, which is where Khalil's from, and they broke into a bank. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a great show if you, if you didn't have a chance to see it, but uh, they've literally broken into this bank. Uh, we're like, you know, uh, taking people from their computers, like the tellers, and saying, excuse me, I'm just here, I, I gotta uh, update your software. And this basically plugs in a USB device that hacks your computer um, from someone just off of the streets um, and got into their uh, financial systems and were able to take control of those uh, full things. Um, so obviously, um, there's a group of us trying to figure out how to best secure and, and ex explain vulnerabilities to companies and provide more uh, awareness because it usually is the humans. Uh, that become our weakest link for it. And so when you look at technology and what we're dealing with, businesses, if you're conducting any type of, of, of business online with technology, security has to be part of that plan. It has to be designed in a way that allows your business to be a, essentially compartmentalized in different areas so that if one of your areas of exposure get, gets compromised, it doesn't impact the rest of your business. And so if you look at building that, it's what we call in the security industry the defense in depth strategy, um, something that, that focuses on multiple layers of security to try to protect yourselves uh, from when these types of things happen. And it's not something that, that's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. These things are legitimately happening uh, all over the place. I came from uh, the intelligence community. I can tell you that uh, uh, when it comes to what we're facing as a nation, uh, we are in direct peer competitors with, with a number of different countries, uh, including Russia, including China, including North Korea. Uh, North Korea to lesser except they're not as good as us. Um, Iran uh, as well. Uh, and we have a number of adversaries that are actively looking at stealing intellectual property. They're actively looking at getting into our water treatment facilities. And by the way, everybody always, always makes the argument, well, why haven't we seen a catastrophic loss in certain locations before? And it's because we all hack each other, and we all don't want to turn each other's systems off. So we, we hack Russia's water treatment facilities, their electric grid. They hack our water treatment facilities and our electric grid. And we all know we, we have access to each other. And we're like, well, we don't want to shut each other off because it impacts both of us. So it's kind of an arms race at this point on when the next thing happens around the types of capabilities that we're seeing out there. Um, and so hopefully, you know, it, it goes to a peaceful uh, type of thing. But we're all hacking each other uh, right now when it comes to it. Um, so that's the interesting part. If you're doing business, must focus on, on security as a day-to-day -day thing. And you know, as an industry, uh, we're growing. Uh, you know, I mentioned that, that hacker conference in, in Black Hat and uh, DEF CON in Vegas. That's been going on. When I started in, in the industry uh, in 2003, I was working for the military, and there was maybe 100 of us at this, this convention in Vegas. You know, it was a small group of hackers, a bunch of computer nerds. Um, literally, we looked like we were in, in our mom's basements. Um, you know, uh, and 100 of us at this pool at a, a place called Lexus Park. And now it's taken over Caesars, where we can't even fit any more people into the place because it's grown so big as an industry. So we have 20,000 plus hackers converging on Vegas once a year to share how we're collectively trying to uh, face what we're dealing with uh, out there today. Um, and there's all, also conferences literally happening every single day. I was at a security conference yesterday. I was working with some of the largest businesses here in New York City, um, helping them defend um, themselves against what's happening out there. We have a, a practice called hunt teaming going on and looking for hackers in your environments. 
And so those are the things that we're doing as an industry to try to get better, and people um, in this industry are really focusing hard on it. But it requires help. We need more folks. Uh, you know, uh, it's a great field. It's a growing field. It's something that, you know, I started my business uh, five years ago, and I have well over 200 employees uh, across the nation. Um, and I get to work with some of the largest companies you can possibly imagine because we're in so demand. Um, and that's one of the cool things about what we're dealing with is that it's not going to stop anytime soon and technology is going to get better. We have to do something about it to protect our future. I want to thank you very much uh, for having me. Hopefully I didn't scare you all too much. Um, I usually do that. Uh, my wife tells me that all the time, so I have to try to tone that back a little bit. Um, if you want the slides, you can always go to binarydefense.com slash iconic and download the slides. Um, but I want to thank everybody here, and I want to thank CNBC and everybody else for, uh, for having me here. It's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker is not going to be quite so scary. Uh, it's somebody you, you do know. It's Ariana Huffington, who will be interviewed by Andrew Ross Sorkin. So let's see what Ariana has to say. She helped change the way we consume media, creating one of the most influential digital news sites in the world the Huffington Post. Now she wants to change the way we live. We are all addicted to technology. That's why we have rituals to stop us from being on all the time. Her latest venture is Thrive Global, a health and wellness hub that's part media platform, part e-commerce, part tech, designed to improve decision-making, creativity, and productivity, and to end what Huffington calls the pandemic of stress and burnout. Boom. In her spare time, she's also on the board of Uber, on the board of trustees of the X Prize Foundation, and she's the author of several acclaimed books. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ariana Huffington, founder and CEO of Thrive Global. Thank you, Ariana, uh, for being here. It is a privilege for me to be here with you uh, and to talk about your new company, but it, which is not so new anymore, but also to talk about being an entrepreneur and how this all happened. Um, a lot of people here know your story, I think, when it comes to the Huffington Post. We may go back there. But I actually want to start with Thrive Global. And what I particularly want to understand, given that I think this is an issue we, everybody here who's an entrepreneur grapples with to some extent, is you were living inside your other company, Huffington Post. And you were talking about wellness and sleep. Uh, we'll get to that as well. Um, and you had built out a lot of those areas inside Huffington Post. But at some point, you decided to build this thing called Thrive Global while you were still there. And then you had to make the leap. How did it happen? So first of all, I love this question because I've never really talked about it. And uh, interestingly enough, the first seed of seeing what I was doing about Thrive, my books, the fact that I had brought that editorial content into the Huffington Post, the first seed of turning it into a new business was planted in Hongzhou by Jack Ma. So I was there to speak at a, a women's conference he had. And when he asked me to speak, I assumed he wanted me to speak on media because at that time, everybody wanted me to speak on media, and he said, no, I want you to speak on the themes of Thrive, the book that had just come out in China, actually. He said, because in China at the moment, stress is one of our biggest problems, and we're having over 100 million people suffering from mental health issues that are stress-related. So at the dinner last night, that night after my speech, he said to me, you know, this is a business. And he said, if I were you, I would leave the Huffington Post and uh, launch a new company around it because there is no market leader and I will uh, invest in it. And at the time, literally, I thought this guy is crazy and I'm never leaving the Huffington Post. You know, it's like my third child. Um, I built it, I run it, I'm never leaving it. I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, politely, though, I said, thank you so much. You know, I have no plans to leave the Huffington Post. Then, Fast forward to my getting more and more engaged in these issues, speaking around the world about these issues. And um, 
realizing that I wanted to do something more than speak and write about them. I wanted to help people implement the changes in their lives. So I, when, I, when the time came to re-up for another four years at AOL, which owned the Huffington Post, which by then was owned by Verizon, uh, I said that in order for me to re-up, I need a carve-out to launch uh, Thrive with what they, they gave me 20% of my time. They were not happy with it, but it was the only way for me to stay on. And then I started raising my Series A. Hold on, let's go back. Okay. How complicated a conversation was it to say, by the way, I'm happy to re-up, but I've been working semi-secretly on the side over here, because a lot of people are semi-secretly working on something on the side that they want to pursue at some point, and you have to tell effectively in this case your boss, even though your name's on the door, that you're doing this. Right. So, um, so first of all, it wasn't a secret at all, because as you know, um, I had these books out, I was, all, I was speaking everywhere, I had launched dedicated sections in the Huffington Post on sleep, on unplugging and recharging, on our relationship with technology, all the themes of Thrive. I think what was different is that I also wanted to build a business right. around them. And uh, it was a tough conversation. And uh, it was really a question of uh, an absolute certainty on my part that I had to do it. And I felt that I could do both, basically, at the time. But as soon as I started raising money and uh, creating um, the roadmap for the company, I realized that I couldn't really do both. And that became very tough for me uh, because I literally had to close my eyes and jump, which is what Sheryl Sandberg, who is one of the few people I had consulted, she said to me, listen, close your eyes, jump, and you'll never look back. So let's talk about that, which is risk. Yes. The risk of starting a new company, um, the risk of being an entrepreneur at different stages in your life, in the life cycle. Uh, sometimes people say it's very easy to take a risk when you're young, you might not have had built a reputation, you might have nothing to lose. But at some point, especially in your life and career, you have a reputation, there's real risk here. There's, there's risk, dare I say, and I hope it never happens to you, but that you could fail. How did you think about that? So I have an interesting relationship to risk and failure, uh, which is really a gift my mother gave me. Uh, she always made us feel that failure is not a problem. Uh, she used to say, failure is not the opposite of success, it's a stepping stone to success. So for me, um, that actually never came into my consideration. I know people have such a different relationship to risk. Uh, you know, I feel very blessed that I am financially independent, so it's not like I was putting my livelihood at risk. Right. So of course that minimizes you know, the existential risk of uh, paying the bills. Or if you have children, like you have three children, you know, yes. paying uh, school bills and um, um, diapers for your third one. <laughs> Very expensive these days. Um, so that kind of risk is eliminated. Also, I think what happens as you get older is that the question of what do people think about you becomes less paramount. You know, I think at the beginning, we all kind of look over our shoulders. Are we being approved? Do people like us? And I think one of the most liberating things about aging is that this becomes less important. And you become more sort of um, sure in who you are and what you want out of your life and less dependent on validation from others. So you don't buy, and there are, there are many who will argue that, some, that when you look at the great entrepreneurs, the sort of great shoot the moon entrepreneurs, whether it be Mark Zuckerberg or you name your person, that you had to do it before 30. No, you know, incidentally, I'm 66. And I don't think there is any age limit to entrepreneurship. I think, in fact, um, when you're older, as I am, um, it's just a great time to launch something new. And that was one of the, of the sort of motivations for me. I said, if I'm going to do it, I have to do it now. 
Okay, but go also go back and talk about a little bit about the calculus. He's good of, at that, right? No, no. <laughs> of, go back and talk about the calculus of leaving the Huffington Post because it yes. does have your name on it, and that's the other piece of this, especially for serial entrepreneurs who build something, and it's even though they sometimes have great ideas, uh, things they want to pursue, they think it's very you know my name's on the door, and if I leave and the thing fails, what does that say? They still think it says something about them. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it would have been very, very hard to leave if I had not built an amazing team, uh, an amazing CEO. Uh, we have an amazing editor-in-chief in Lydia Paul Green who succeeded me. Uh, I think that was key, knowing somehow that I was leaving my baby in great hands, and it's turned out to be that way. And I really... Um, believe that after all part of leadership is building great teams and that's becoming increasingly important and uh, and i had spent a lot of time doing that i had learned from my mistakes along okay, the so way biggest biggest mistake in terms of choosing people because that's that is i think one of the great challenges that everybody faces how do you choose the right people so i have this one rule um, which i learned the hard way which is no brilliant jerks allowed no brilliant jerks allowed. Yes. What about, what about dumb jerks? No dumb jerks either, but the, that's easy. The no dumb jerks rule is easy. We all have it. The harder rule is no brilliant jerks. And often, you know, you come across people who are brilliant, who you know are going to be great, but you know they're going to be toxic for the culture. And I have an absolute rule, which is no, don't go there. And if you go there by mistake, fire them as fast as possible. And. Uh, the truth is there is nothing worse for a culture than quote unquote top performers who are um, really undermining their colleagues, who are creating an atmosphere where people can't be their best, they can't create, they can't build teams. So you said you learned the hard way. You don't have to name names, but, but tell us the story. <laughs> so really, um, there was a moment when I realized that someone who was um, really good at their job, was incredibly toxic, where I had people coming up to me complaining about how undermined they were. Um, and it was a very hard decision because he was very good. So how, but she how do, was very good. How do you I'm not giving a pronoun. How do you identify that in advance? Meaning there's some people who are great at, you know, they're great at the interview. They're great at, I've, I've done it. I've, I've, I've made the mistake many a times. You, you, you have the job interview. They, they seem like the perfect person. And oftentimes you know pretty soon whether you made the mistake. Yes. The mistake is, is usually relatively obvious. But in this case, was that obvious? Well, I'll tell you how you identified um, earlier. What I do now during interviews, I say, listen, I want to tell you there is something that I'm completely allergic to. I said, nobody likes it, but I'm completely allergic to it. And this is passive aggressive people. So I said, I give you complete permission. And this is at any level of the organization, because at the Huffington Post, where we ended up being about 900 people before I left, and at Thrive Global, where we are now 75 people, I interview everybody. So my, this is, a, this is a, a speech I give to everybody, which is, I give you full permission to walk into my office and scream at me if you're unhappy, if I did something you don't like. But I want you to consider this as your last warning if instead you go and complain about me or any of your colleagues behind their back. I want a completely transparent culture. If, if you're working with Andrew and you're upset with Andrew, I want you to go and talk with and to Andrew. If you want somebody to help mediate you, we have a team of people who can help and talk with you and Andrew. But I think the most toxic thing is I'm upset with Andrew, but instead of coming to you, I go to 10 people behind you and complain about Andrew. This is, this is the way to destroy a company very, very quickly. And so I, may, I give that speech at the beginning, and it does make a difference. You begin to you see how people react. Do you have a favorite job interview question? You know, I always want to know what do people want to do in five years. Because it, it shows you know, where their heart is. And do they see this job as a stepping stone? OK, this one's hard. You have a very high profile. How do you deal with this issue, which is to say that in, in a company with your name on it, or, or just given your involvement, you are going to get an enormous amount of credit. You will get the credit and the blame. But it can make it very complicated 
for those who work for you. Because, by the way, they may want the credit, right? And uh, they probably don't want the blame. Um, <laughs> but managing the sort of, um, there is a sort of ego issue yes. of how to deal with a very high profile person like yourself um, and to attract people to then want to work around you and to support you because a lot of what they're doing is supporting you. What, well, it's what's really the trick supporting, on that? Because it, it's, it's a complicated not, one. It's not supporting me though, it's supporting the mission of the organization. I mean, I'm in the process now of interviewing for a COO for Thrive Global. That person would be a true partner. And it's very clear in my conversations, and I'm in final conversations with someone who would be amazing. You would absolutely love that person. And I see that person as a true partner. Right. And that means making decisions together. And that means also that person being a thought leader, not just being behind the scenes, making the trains run on time, being here with you, having right. a conversation, writing pieces. I mean, I get, as, as you do, you know, hundreds of invitations to speak, for example. Our communications team knows 90% of them will be passed on to other leaders in the organization so that we build our own leaders. And I'm not the only one speaking for Thrive Global as I was not the only one speaking for the Huffington Post. Right. Now, you've started now several companies and I imagine you've made some mistakes yes. along the way. Big, big one that you wish you could go back and change? Uh, you know, the, I think the biggest mistakes are always hiring mistakes because it's incredibly, um, it's hard to then move, first of all, admit it. <laughs> I think I've gotten much better at admitting it faster. Right. And one of the things I learned, never interview when you are tired. I think my biggest hiring mistakes were, were when I was interviewing when I was tired, and frankly, I just wanted to cross one more thing off my to-do list. Right and I ignored the red flags and I just wanted to say, okay, this is done, this position is filled. So I think only interview when you are fully recharged. Andrew, I always remember the story you told me of when you were on vacation, uh, where was it, in, the, in Congo, some exotic place in the Caribbean or somewhere, and God. you got like a full night's sleep for three nights in a row. Bhutan. 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 Okay, yes, very where I should have been meditating and doing all of the things. But that how you, you walk up after I think it was three nights yes. of amazing sleep and uh -huh. you felt like a new person, like you had not I felt for a long time. I remember telling the story. Time. I always remember that story because I think when people have that experience, it becomes something that draws them. It's like right. you want to feel that way again. So I only interview when I'm in that space. Okay, so let's, let's go to culture, because one of the things that you've tried to do is not just transform the culture of your own company, but transform the culture of everybody's uh, company and, frankly, uh, the country. And part of that is sleep, and part of that is meditation. Yes. One of the things that I wrestle with, as you know, is I, I'm one of these people who thinks that they're working all, you know, 24 hours a day. And I think a lot of people in this room are, think that they're either, that they need to work 24 hours a day, or if they're not physically working, that their mind needs yes. to be. You think that's a terrible idea. Well, and it's not just what I think. We have the latest science that proves it and that validates ancient wisdom about that. And here's what is ironic, Andrew, that we claim to be data driven, but in fact, we're ignoring the data here. And I have an example recently, as you know, I've been working closely with Travis Kalanick in the transformation Uber. of Uber. And, um, and Uber um, is going through a big transformation right now. And it has to start at the top. So first, Travis started recognizing how differently he made decisions when he had gotten enough sleep. And then he started meditating. And literally, it was an amazing moment last week when we were in the office, and he said, I really need to go meditate in order to be in a place to make good decisions right now. And he literally went into a, a, a lactation room that happened to be open <laughs> because they don't have meditation rooms yet. This is part of the change coming. And I believe every company soon is going to have a meditation slash nap room. They're going to be as common as conference rooms because people are recognizing the value. If you are feeling that you are running on empty, if you are feeling that you are not as productive, why shouldn't your boss want you to go and take a 20 minute meditation break or nap break and return recharge? You know, who wouldn't want that? This should, would become another productivity enhancement. And literally, Travis returned 
And he said, and you could see the change in the way he was and therefore in the way he could process making decisions. How many hours do you think you work a day? So here's the thing. I, I really don't separate my work and my life. I actually happen to love my work. So um, all I need is to get my eight hours sleep, which I get 95% uh, of the time. There are right. always exceptions. Last night I flew in from LA uh, late, so I didn't get eight hours sleep. I hope it doesn't show too much, because here's the thing. <laughs> you are, you know, I think the great thing is that if you normally get all the sleep you need, it's okay, you have reserves. So it's not as critical. It's really when you are perpetually not getting the sleep you need that it becomes problematic, as we're seeing in the White House. I mean, look, Andrew, we are... It always gets <laughs> political with Ariana. No, but isn't it interesting how... I mean, when I started saying that, that Donald Trump is a classic case of um, sleep deprivation, you know, the tweets in the middle of the night, et cetera, <laughs> now you have front-page stories in multiple newspapers with sleep experts discussing that, which is really an amazing, an amazing teachable moment. So maybe that's going to be his greatest contribution to humanity. <laughs> serious question. If you could take a nap. I think that was very serious. <laughs> no, no. And, and you'll know the science on this. I don't know the answer. If you could take a nap, meditate, or go to the gym, which would be better for you? A thousand percent meditate if you are a meditator. A lot of people are not meditators, so it's harder for them to move into a meditation space. Nap uh, if you are not a meditator, and the gym is third. Gym is always, oh, that makes me feel better. Yeah, the gym is always third. The gym is also third, even if, you want, if your goal is to lose weight. You know, just uh, read the data. If you, go to the, if you wake up earlier than your body is ready to wake up to go to the gym, your body all day is going to crave sugars and carbs in order to balance your sleep deprivation deficit. And again, it's scientific. And therefore, you're better off getting more sleep and skipping the gym, which will make it easier for you to stay away from carbs and sugar. You don't have to worry. So here, I was eating the donuts out there. Here, here's, um, and they're good, by the way. Um, the muffins I thought were better. Um, the, when you think about your business now and what you're doing, there's sort of two things going on in parallel, and I think you would say they're, they're, they're completely intertwined. One is building the business itself. The other is evangelizing, if you will, uh, this new sort of culture and world that, and, and, and lifestyle that we should all be living. In terms of measuring success five years from now, if we were sitting here, how would you measure it? Would it be about the P&L of the company? Would it be about if everybody here has changed their, um, their, their own uh, behavior, but maybe they're not necessarily buying the products from Thrive Global, but, buy, but either buying them elsewhere or, or doing things on their own? How do you think about that? So I do see them as really interconnected. And um, obviously, the, the mission of the company is a culture shift. And it's not a culture shift that we are creating. It's a culture shift we are accelerating. Because the culture shift is already happening. Our goal is to help accelerate it in two ways. One is through our media platform, which is basically like the Huffington Post, except only on one topic. Right. Uh, bringing together the latest science on how to avoid stress and burnout and the connection between recharging and productivity. Do you feel like you're competing against the Huffington Post on that? No. No? No. The Huffington Post is an amazing site that covers the world, that covers the commie uh, investigations. But they, they do a lot of wellness, that's why I asked. Yes, but there are hundreds. The Wall Street Journal does a lot right. of wellness. CNBC does a lot of wellness. That is really what is fantastic now that everybody's covering these topics. We are covering them relentlessly from every angle and globally. So we are the hub for all the latest science and for new role models. I was telling you backstage that our pieces on new role models, which is successful people who are doing success differently, Jeff Bezos writing, why am I getting eight hours sleep? is good for Amazon shareholders, went crazy viral because people were stunned to hear it. 
Um, I talked to you about Barry Summers. Right. Um, works at JP Morgan. Who works at JP Morgan, the CEO of, of uh, Private Wealth. Um, he meditates twice a day. He says his secretary um, never puts anything in the afternoon meditation slot, sleeps, sleeps for seven hours, works out every day. And when I was speaking at the JP Morgan retreat, I had somebody come up to me after and said, you know, that's all very well, Ariana, but I'm very busy here. I have a big job and I can't do that. I said, who do you report to? He said, Barry Summers. I said, I said Barry does that. So that's why these execs But it's need always to talk easier about for the boss to do it. It always is easier for but the boss, the boss to do it. But if the boss talks about it, if the boss... Even when the boss talks about it, it's easier for them to do okay, it. Okay, listen, to do it. it's not going to be easy for everybody to be pioneers, but I think it helps if the people at the top who, are, who see the benefit from right. these behavioral changes. And all, all that we recommend in the second part of the company, which is the corporate trainings, um, is micro steps to change. Right. You know, nothing dramatic. And, and you know the biggest micro step. We need to give everybody here, all the entrepreneurs News here, you can use. One little micro step. At the end of the day, even if you start with five minutes before you're going to turn off your lights, turn off all your devices and gently escort them out of your bedroom. <laughs> I bet the majority of you sleep with your phones by your bed. It is scientifically terrible. Uh, you know, because also many of us wake up in the middle of the night for whatever reason and then you are tempted to go to your phone because it, no matter how much willpower you think you have, we are all slightly addicted. Mm -hmm. And so that small act will help you wake up so much more recharged. And that's why our first product is a little charging station that looks like a phone bed. Bed, yes. Where you can put your phones, you can tuck them in under a blanket. <laughs> it's a lovely ritual. And human, have I sent you one? You, you have not, but I'm going to buy one. I'm sending you no, one. No, 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 no. Please. Um, <laughs> I have two more questions, then I want to open it up uh, to the audience. And I know uh, folks have been tweeting in, so tweet, keep tweeting in your, your, your questions. Um, there's a lot of startups here. And I'm curious, in terms of lessons you learned, Ariana, in starting up a company, both in Huffington Post and now Thrive Global, in terms of who your partners are, who your investors are. Did anything change between what you learned from the experience in Huffington Post, both in starting it and selling it, and influence your thinking around how to frame up and structure this new company. Well, absolutely. So a lot changed. <laughs> when uh, Kenny Lair, my partner, and I were raising money for, uh, for the Huffington Post, we didn't have a lot of people believing in it, so we took money from anyone who would give us money. With Thrive Global, I was really lucky uh, to only take money from people who are very committed to the mission whether it was Ray Dalio, who, as you know, right. is also a meditator from Bridgewater. Or Transcendental Sean, meditation, TM. Transcendental meditation, or Sean Parker, who is also a big believer in what technology is doing to our brains and therefore wanted to support it, or, uh, as I mentioned, Jack Ma, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a group of investors um, that is just amazingly committed to the success and, and has, has provided help beyond money. So if you can have investors who are committed beyond giving you money, it's a great, great uh, benefit. Then a board. I have a small board, but an unbelievable board. I mean, on it is Mark Bertolini. Uh, CEO of Aetna. CEO of Aetna, who is also a great meditator. A great meditator, a great believer in all this, who brought them into Aetna. As you know, he's even uh, paying people cash uh, who sleep, em when I say people, employees, who sleep for seven hours or more for 28 days. So that's how committed he is to these ideas as enhancements of productivity and a company's bottom line. Dr. David Agus, whom you know. Mm -hmm. Um, who is, um, in, I mean, like we have a weekly phone calls beyond, you know, their participation in the board, Kenny Lair, et cetera. So I think trying to have a group of investors who are also supporters and a board that's actually a working board and not, you know. Um, what about control? 
Absolutely. Complete control. Uh, voting shares. I mean, every, every... But did it change between the way you did Huffington yes. Post? Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I, um, I have complete control of Thrive Global because I control the voting shares. Which you didn't in Huffington Post? Which I didn't in Huffington Post. Was that a mistake? No, I mean, I was lucky in that I had a fantastic um, co-founder right. and uh, partner. And also when we sold to AOL, uh, Tim Armstrong and I had a, a great arrangement that he always honored of complete independence. So literally, right. he never interfered editorially. Uh, he always supported, but I, that, I know that's, that's an exception. You know, most of the time when you sell a company, um, you really lose control. Uh, right now, I have to say that one of my investors is my youngest daughter. Uh, she's a painter. She's making a modest living as a painter. And when she could hear me raising money, she said, Mommy, I decided to take all my savings, which were $100,000, and put it in the company. The only problem is that she, you have to give her a lesson on what an IPO is and how it happens. Because now, whenever there's some good news um, about the company, like there's a great piece in Adweek this week, um, she sort of texts me and says, so how much closer are we to the IPO? <laughs> uh, well, we, we hope you will have an IPO. And uh, this has been a terrific conversation. Uh, we do have a number of questions that I think have been coming in. And I'm told that they will come on the screen. So let me read a couple to you. Uh, first question. What have been some of your failures, and what have you learned from them? Maybe in addition, I, 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 you're going to think that we're all about failure here, because I think I pushed you on this a little too. I called it mistakes, which I thought was more polite. No, I think failure is a, is a word we should totally accept. And, and frankly, there is no entrepreneur who has not failed along the way. And I think this is so important to remember. I think what happens is that when people succeed, it's almost as if their failures are buried. And I think it is imperative that successful entrepreneurs talk about their failures. I just want to say something that's connected to our conversation, which is if you think that three quarters of startups fail, and that there is the entrepreneur myth that the lights are always on, right. that you never sleep, that you never recharge, there is a connection between the two. Because your decision making is impaired. So that's a tremendous lesson for entrepreneurs. Let's go to the next question. So how do I let myself live day to day without anxiously thinking and worrying about what I want to do in the future? <laughs> I think um, for me, the biggest lesson here is gratitude. It's like every day we can focus on the things that are working in our lives or the things that are not working. We all have a mixture of both, right? So the more I focus on gratitude, uh, the more I, I love what I'm doing, the less anxious I become about how quickly I'm going to get to where I'm going. Do you have a trick to remind yourself to have the gratitude? Because I know that I should, but then sometimes in the moment I frankly forget that I should, and if I reminded myself, maybe I'd be in a better place. Yes, I, lo I love doing um, three, th at night, three things I'm grateful for. And uh, in the morning, three things I'm grateful for about this day. You were on the list, Andrew Ross Arkin. Oh, God bless you. <laughs> and you'll be on my list tonight. Um, is, there a is there a, for today, uh, is there a difference between venting and passive aggressive behavior? If so, how do you distinguish the difference? There is a difference. You can vent in front of the person you're upset with, and that's fine. I really have unlimited tolerance for people being upset with me. My complete zero tolerance is for people who express upset behind somebody's back. You see the right. distinction? Mm -hmm. People can get upset. There are misunderstandings. Relationships are complicated, whether they are personal or professional. It would be like your, with your wife, even in the best of marriages. Um, there are things that go wrong. If you don't surface them right. quickly and deal with them, they fester and they affect the relationship. Right. OK, let's get to the next. How do you recommend getting into meditation? And I will say on behalf of Jeffrey Bourne that I suffered this problem for a very long time because it takes a lot of time. 
you sit there, you're thinking, you're supposed to be saying your mantra, this word over and over again, and then you know, these thoughts are coming through your head, but you're supposed to let them go out the other side. <laughs> but it, half the time it doesn't work. Okay, so two very, very simple ways, and you can choose. One is to think of it as focusing simply on your breath. You don't need a mantra to start meditating. You can just focus on consciously inhaling and exhaling, you know, like inhaling to the tune of four, you know, one, two, three, four, exhaling five, so you have a longer exhale. Just doing that and start with five minutes. The most important thing is to start. If you don't want to start by yourself and your own breath, start with a guided meditation, headspace. Is great. Both Andrew and I have it been, works. Uh, I believe have, it. Have practiced it, and it works amazingly. So then you can start with a guided meditation, and as you graduate, Headspace has can get you into a meditation, and you're si that silent after a right. while. You know. Do you think that people have to know that it's an investment in time and energy? Because in the beginning, it doesn't often feel like it's working, and and I think a lot of people who haven't done meditation think that there's like a magic thing to it, like yes. you're going to do it and something's going to happen, like there's going to be, you're going to feel it. Right. And all, at least for me, it took a very long time to get to that place. Absolutely. If you think of it as an investment, and if you don't judge yourself, you know, I think the reason it took Andrew so long is because he's a perfectionist. <clears throat> and he had, I'm, I'm not talking behind his back, I'm just referring to him in the third person. And he, therefore, thought that it had to be a certain way, right? And if you just uh, remove expectations and judgments and just literally say, I'm going to invest five minutes or ten minutes to just sit here or lie in my bed and focus on my breathing or listen to Headspace or go to Alexa if you have Alexa and have them play you the Thrive skill. We have a great sleep meditation on Alexa. Um, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. We'll have to Call the Thrive skill. So whatever, you know, there are many ways. The only thing you should never do is, is play any meditations on your phone. So Headspace should not be on your phone because you're going to be tempted at some point to go to text. I, I give people as, um, as gifts iPods with all my favorite meditations, with anything that... With old school iPods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good idea. Uh, we've we have one final question for you. When successful, how do you not get comfortable and lazy? So what is it that drives you? What is this about? So I've never had that problem because I, <laughs> because I, I love what I'm doing. I love affecting change. I love seeing things transforming, whether it's our culture, whether it's Uber, whether it's the Huffington Post, whether it's my new company. I just love this process of transformation both at the individual level and the company level. So comfortable and lazy have not been a problem. <laughs> the one and only Ariana Huffington, everybody. Coming up, Iconic New York continues live beginning at 1.20 p.m. Eastern. Longtime beauty industry veteran Bobby Brown takes the iconic stage. The entrepreneur, author, and founder of Bobby Brown Cosmetics will join Inc. Magazine editor-at-large Kimberly Weissel to discuss Brown's entrepreneurial journey and the steps you need to take in order to successfully maneuver through the ever-changing business landscape. At 1.55 p.m. Eastern, Che Huang, founder and CEO of the disruptive bulk shopping site, Boxed.com, will sit down with CNBC small business and entrepreneurship reporter, Kate Rogers. Huang famously committed to funding his employees' kids' college tuition and will discuss the importance of how to positively impact your employees. Huang, a longtime believer in upward mobility, will reveal the secret to getting and keeping employees who want to work for you. Then, let's make a deal. Deepak Malhotra will take the iconic stage at 2.35 p.m. Eastern to teach you how to confidently negotiate in any business endeavor. Malhotra is the author of Negotiating the Impossible and the Eli Goldston Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. 
With his negotiation, conflict resolution, and deal-making skills, Malhotra will help you exude confidence in your business dealings. And at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, a shark arrives at Iconic. Damon John, co-star of Shark Tank, will join CNBC Squawk on the Street and Squawk Alley co-anchor Carl Quintanilla to offer you the key tips for growth and success. All this and much more coming up later today, live from Iconic New York, presented by Inc. and CNBC. And greetings from Iconic New York being presented by CNBC and Inc.com. We have a, a lot more coming up this afternoon in the rundown, as you just heard. But uh, let's talk about what's happening here. And we have hundreds joining us today right here in Midtown New York. A lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of budding entrepreneurs seeking advice and also with a, a lot of innovative pitches as well. And one of our familiar faces on CNBC, on our power pitch now joins us, Alicia Siret. Good to see you. It's great to see you too. Now, you know, you're in the business of finding companies, right. of uh, identifying successful companies in the future. So, you know, what goes into a successful pitch? Well, first of all, I think the person has to be really prepared, although they shouldn't come across as being too memorized. And you just have to know all the main points that you want to convey to the investor, whether it's exactly what you do and the company, and the, the focus on the market size and competitive advantage and what your fundraising needs are and being able to say it in a very succinct way in like a minute. Now, if someone wants to learn more, then you can you know, go through all the details, but that's it. You really have to ha have your elevator pitch ready. Right. Do people actually get a minute these days? Yeah, I think they do. I thought it was 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> no, I think a minute's fine, and then you can expand yeah. upon that. Okay, so how about here so far at Iconic New York? Have you heard any great pitches so far? Well, you know what's funny is that it was less so the pitches and more people just asking for strategic advice. So I came into it thinking that it was all going to be pitch feedback, but it really wasn't. For the people who did ask for pitch feedback, it really was a matter of breaking it down to like seven or eight sentences that fit in that minute time frame and helping them think through structurally all the aspects of the business that we should be talking about. Let's talk about that. Seven okay. to eight sentences. Seven to eight sentences. What do I need to include in those seven to eight sentences? Well, some of the big things are exactly what your company does, who you are, you know, who's behind it, your team, what your competitive advantage is, what your market size is, who your customer is, how you're reaching them, again, what your funding needs are, any kind of major tractions for the business, where the money's going to if you raise it, but that's pretty much it. Those are some of the big things. And if you can fit that in in you know, 45 seconds, you might have another sentence or two you can throw in about a personal pain point or right. something funny, but that's, you know, those are the main things. Well, Alicia, you know that they say the communication, 90% of it is nonverbal. Yes. So yes. In, in this case, if I'm an entrepreneur trying to make this pitch, you know, how do I communicate non-verbally? Well, I think that you can't be too nervous and that's where the practice comes in. So you hopefully have done the pitch a uh, you know, hundred times at home. So by the time you're actually presenting to someone, you know your stuff, you have that confidence. So don't be too nervous. Also be comfortable with your own skin, smile, You know, try to make a connection. If you feel like you're pitching to someone and they're just like so distant from you and you can't relate to them, they'll feel that too. Mm -hmm. So you've got to just practice like that connection and making sure that you're not doing anything that's like socially awkward or. <laughs> <laughs> no, we would never do that, especially not on television. Of course not. Um, well, what about appearance? I mean, do you need to, to match the industry you're selling to? Well, it depends. I think that you really need to do whatever plays well to the investor. So if the investor is more institutionalized, they may appreciate it if you're wearing a suit or you're wearing something that's more professional dress. But if you're in the tech sector and the venture capitalist is wearing, you know, jeans and a t-shirt, then maybe it's not so good to dress up and put a suit on um, so that they might find that off-putting. Right. You really have to tailor it to the type of conference, the event, and the person. Right, right, exactly. If you're in fashion, you probably want to you know, stand out a little bit more. Now, speaking of being more unique, is, yeah. is there an element in my pitch that I guess should make it memorable for the person I'm pitching to? Well, I think one of the biggest memorable areas is the traction of the business, right? So if you can clearly articulate, I've, you know, generated this much in revenues, or I have the, these major clients, or I, I have these huge partnerships, or I've 
filed for and achieved these patents, those are some of the biggest things that attract investors' attention right. because it de-risks their investment. So I would say lead with, you know, put your best foot forward with all the major traction points. Okay, lead with your best traction points. Yes, so exactly. numbers, revenue, money making. Any of those big things. It could be user growth, it could be any kind of distribution relationships, whatever that big differentiator is on the progress, that's something that they care about. Okay, now I'm just gonna throw this in here because, okay, okay some people say name dropping, talking bigger than you are, faking it till you make it. We talked right. to Swell's founder, okay. Sarah Cross today, and she, that was one of the mantras that when she was young in her startup, you fake it till you make it. Right. I mean, look, I think that that's true to some extent. You have to be confident as an entrepreneur. And so there is a little bit, bit of that in there. You know, you, you've got to put yourself out there and you're going to get a lot of rejections. But with that said, there's a fine line. If you're too salesy, if you're promising something that you can't deliver on, or if people find out that there's more smoke than substance, then it'll come back to bite you. So you do have to be careful about that. Okay, yeah, you do have to be careful about that. What about cold calling? Like, do you pick up the phone and just call somebody out of the blue? I mean, look, you can, but I'd highly recommend getting a warm introduction whenever possible. And the truth is, is if someone you know makes that introduction, the person on the receiving end has an even higher obligation to make sure that they make a good impression on you, and that's what you ideally want in any meeting. Okay, that, okay so that's what you should do. You should get an introduction if you can. first. <laughs> yes, if you, if you can, can, then cold email. Okay. But yes, if you can possibly get the warm intro, go for that first. Okay, go for the warm intro first. Now, in all your years, what, what has been, I guess, the, some of the pitches that have stood out to you? Can you point to one, give us an example uh, of what you consider a successful pitch? Well, I think it's when you really want to learn more about the person, where you feel like their passion is contagious, yeah. they seem really sharp, they seem to know all the answers to the questions that are thrown at them, yeah. and at the same time, they seem like someone you'd want to work with. Right. You know, some of the investments I make, I may be tied to the company for 10 plus years, <laughs> so I want to like the person too, I want to know it's a good business opportunity. So it's that feeling that they really know their stuff, and they're, in, they're doing something very interesting, but then I also like them, right. and I want to work with them more too. <laughs> That's kind of what Mark Zuckerberg Zuckerberg says, right? Probably yeah. Fair. It's, I think it's a fair assessment. So any companies you can point to where you said, okay, this is like an example from your professional life that you can share with us? So where I really like the entrepreneur? Yeah, you, yeah the company. Yeah, the company. sure. Well, there's um, there are a couple examples I can think of. There's a guy named Noah Densel who runs Nomad, and I actually invested in his company. And he is just such a sharp guy and super motivated and always innovating. It's a consumer hardware company. And then there's another woman, Diana Lovett from CSA Trading Co. It's Fair Trade Coco Products. She was a Fulbright scholar who then went on to uh, study at Cambridge and Yale. And um, she's just so motivated by what she does. And there's a social mission behind it. So both of those are, are individuals who have built great companies. But I also just really like them and I believe in what they're doing. That's Okay, well, of course you have to. You if you're going to put money behind you it. You have to. Um, can I just also ask you about sure. the dollar amounts uh, that should be included in your pitch? I mean, how do you know what to ask for, if that right. makes sense? Well, look, I think that it depends on where your company is, the stage of growth, and what's considered normal in the industry. A lot of companies that when they first raise from friends and family, that may be checks as little as like 20,000 or maybe an aggregate it's 100,000. By the time you get to an angel network, yeah. these rounds are anywhere from like 250K, 500K, upwards of one or two million dollars. Right. So depending on where your company is and who you're pitching, you have to kind of go within that framework. Right. By the time you get to VCs, you may be trying to raise multiple, multiple millions of dollars. It right. could be five million checks, 10 million checks. So really knowing your growth stage of your company and then who you're targeting, that should determine how you position your raise. All right. Well, this has been very informative. Thank Thanks you. For having Thank me. you. Alicia Surratt there, very informative. Now, you know, one, um, I guess one avenue, one industry that we talked about here at Iconic today, and it was surprisingly how interesting it was and how relevant it was, is cybersecurity. And we caught up with David Kennedy, who's the founder and CEO of Trust the Second, also Binary Defense. Breaking into stuff is easy, right? Because there's so much information out there for us, um, it's, it's possible for us to essentially do anything. Physical security by far is the easiest for us. We just impersonate anybody we want to. It's best is if you dress in a suit, put on your phone and you act like you're busy. Walk into any building you want to, including some of the most secure places. Uh, I've actually, I won't even talk about that one actually. Uh, so we'll <laughs> some fun tricks. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's one, one second here. Hopefully it plays, come on. 
Here we go. I've got to find where the mouse is at. I'm, I can hack into computer systems, but apparently I can't uh, play a video. All right, hang on a second. I'll fix this. All right, so just look up here really quick. I'll hit play. So in these cases, um, doors have sensors. And in sensors, uh, when, you, when you open up a door building that's locked, you can actually use e-cigarettes to trigger the motion sensors on the other side to open up the doors for you. I don't smoke, by the way, but I always carry an e-cigarette with me, uh, just to make sure. It's actually in my bag right now. I broke into like three places when I was coming here. But. So you open up a door that way, right? <laughs> So you ever need to get into a bank? I was actually a funny story. Uh, I was breaking into a bank. <laughs> and uh, um, I've been wanting to do this e-cigarette trick for, for such a long time. I've been like, like it's going to work. It's going to work. I've tested it out. This is where I tested it out on. Uh, this is at a hotel. Um, and so I'm like, all right, I'm going to test it out. So I go to this bank, and it's like 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm like in all black. You know, I got throat mics. We're communicating with my other guy. You know, we're breaking into this bank building. And our whole goal is to get to this vault and get to the vault and then, you know, break into the vault and then take the money out, take pictures, and then put the money back, unfortunately. Um, but we got into this bank, and we're at the front door, and I'm sitting there for like five minutes blowing smoke into this, this, this door trying to trigger this motion sensor to work. We had already disabled the security system, actually did this time. Um, and one of my other folks, um, uh, Ben, which is right there, he, he's actually like 37, looks like he's like 14. Um, <laughs> But uh, Ben was, was, was going around the building to see if there's any other, other ways into there. So I'm out there for like 10 minutes now at this point, blowing smoke in this, and I finally get it to work, and I'm so excited. I walk in, and Ben's sitting there on the counter, like, <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> and I'm like, Ben, how did you get in? Did you use the, the, the cigarette trick somewhere else? And he's like, no, nah, man, the side door was open. They forgot to lock it. I'm like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, if you ever need to get into a bank with whiskey, this is my good buddy, Deviant. Got motion sensors on the top. <laughs> or you can just dress up in suits and, and pretend that it's someone's birthday. That's Biebs. Looks like Justin Bieber. And then this is us actually walking into the building. And walking past, while they're doing the balloons, we walk right into the building, and then we plug into the network, and we hack and steal all our data. So physicals can definitely be um, pretty easy. But there is some good news in all of this, OK? There is good news. The good news is there's a whole class of us out there, hackers. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. I'm using uh, uh, someone else's computer, and uh, when I hit the up arrow, it takes like 30 seconds to respond. So, uh, um, but. Uh, the good news is there are a whole class of hackers out there that are designed to try to figure out what's happening in the industry and try to protect folks. Everything from when you saw the WannaCry stuff happen. When, when WannaCry was happening, does everybody know how that got stopped and why it wasn't so catastrophic as we thought it was going to be? Uh, one guy, the website was not registered, so one guy bought the website. Yep. A 22-year-old kid out of the UK was trying to help, 22 years old, was trying to help and he was taking a look at the malware and saw that when, when it was launching, it was going out to a website that, that wasn't registered. And it was an accident. He, he registered the domain name to trying to figure out the website to see how many people were getting inf infected by WannaCry. And what the hackers had actually done is built in protection mechanisms against security defenses. And it said, if this website is up, shut yourself down because we think we're inside of what's called a sandbox, something that, that is looking for us to see if we're bad or not. And so as a way of defeating um, the security techniques that we use today, but this 22-year-old registered this domain name, and so what happened is when the virus called out to say, hey, are you up and running? Is this website up and running? Am I inside of a sandbox? It's like, yep, the website's up and running. It actually stopped catastrophic loss across the world, and literally here in the United States. He found it just before we went into work here in the United States. So there's a whole group of us dedicated out there trying to protect folks against these types of things that are happening. And believe me, when, when WannaCry happened, it was on a Thursday night, of course. I didn't sleep all of Friday. I happened to go on a, another news organization at like, like 5 o'clock in the morning. I hadn't slept for two days, so I had like bags underneath my eyes. And you know, I had the, the suit on, but I was wearing gym shorts. Um, and I did the Charles Barkley. Uh, that's how it works. Um, but those types of things are things that we're trying to, to defend against. There's a whole group of us out there for it. Here's something that I did on With over 20,000 hackers in one Here's place. something I did on on uh, Defcon's uh, the perfect venue for Discovery them to prepare Channel. for an upcoming bank hack in Beirut, Lebanon. So my good friends Jason 
I mean, what's up? I thought what's you could up? break into anywhere. You couldn't even get in our hotel oh, door. Oh, screw you, man. <laughs> screw you. The beauty of this community is that I don't know all this in this one field, but I've got a friend who does. So what do you need? What do you want? Yeah, so we're doing a bank job, and then our, we're going all the way. Like, So we're going to do the full penetration testing, yeah. everything, and full social engineering. Well, good news is I have uh, an unpublished version of the social engineering toolkit uh, where I just rewrote um, all the PowerShell injection techniques. I had a new one uh, I did recently with it. So security guards, um, you know, have their phones next to them. Right. So I spoofed a text message to the security guard, letting him know that there was an issue outside. He went outside, and then I broke into the building that way. So it works really well. So it's, it's great. Down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is sweet and scary. What's up, dude? Dude. Of all the hackers here, few know tech better than Darren Kitchen. We know you have some new stuff right. that's coming out. So He's one. patented one of the most potent devices now in use and brought several that aren't even on the market yet. So if you need to do any uh, wireless on this engagement, this guy, pineapple. So it's on right now, my phone's connected to it. Check this out. So someone's already Turn off, getting... turn off your Wi-Fi. <laughs> Everybody turn off everything now. Everybody turn off your wi you guys. But yeah, check this out. So we've got basically everyone in the vicinity. Oh my gosh. Right? So basically, man, this is a, a malicious access point. Think right. about it from this factor. You know, people go to Starbucks all the time. They go right. to hotels. Right. When they join those networks, your computer records those settings. So right. next time you power your computer on, it's like, hey, is Starbucks here? Hey, is this hotel here? And that intercepts that and says, yep, always, I'm yep, Starbucks, me. connect to me. So if I was a bad guy, I could actually uh, manipulate the, the websites they go to. Yeah. Now you're the man in the middle. So I can create a fake web page that looks like Facebook, or it'll look like uh, the homepage for Google or Gmail. It'll look like the homepage for several banks and make you put in your user ID and password there, and you think you're going to the legitimate site. Yeah, but they don't even realize right. it. So we're, yeah, we're definitely going to use that. Yeah. So you guys going to get physical access to any of these machines? We're plan well, if, even if you only have a few seconds, I brought you some ducky payload. So what's nice about this one uh, specifically is uh, um, if you actually watch the whole show, um, we, we basically armed Jason uh, with enough stuff and Khalil, good buddies of mine, um, and they went to Lebanon, which is where Khalil's from, and they broke into a bank. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a great show if you, if you didn't have a chance to see it, but uh, they literally broke into this bank. Uh, we're like, you know, uh, taking people from their computers, like the tellers, and saying, excuse me, I'm just here, I, I gotta uh, update your software, and this basically plugs in a USB device that hacks their computer um, from someone just off of the street, um, and got into their uh, financial systems and were able to take control of those uh, full things. Um, so obviously, um, there's a group of us trying to figure out how to best secure and, and ex explain vulnerabilities to companies and provide more uh, awareness because it usually is the humans uh, that become our weakest link for it. And so when you look at technology and what we're dealing with, businesses, if you're conducting any type of, of, of business online with technology, security has to be part of that plan. It has to be designed in a way that allows your business to be a, essentially compartmentalized in different areas so that if one of your areas of exposure get, gets compromised, it doesn't impact the rest of your business. And so if you look at building that, it's what we call in the security industry the defense in depth strategy, um, something that, that focuses on multiple layers of security to try to protect yourselves uh, from when these types of things happen. And it's not something that, that's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. These things are legitimately happening uh, all over the place. I came from uh, the intelligence community. I can tell you that uh, uh, when it comes to what we're facing as a nation, uh, we are in direct peer competitors with, with a number of different countries, uh, including Russia, including China, including North Korea. Uh, North Korea to lesser except they're not as good as us. Um, Iran uh, as well. Uh, and we have a number of adversaries that are actively looking at stealing intellectual property. They're actively looking at getting into our water treatment facilities. And by the way, everybody always, always makes the argument, well, why haven't we seen a catastrophic loss in certain locations before? And it's because we all hack each other, and we all don't want to turn each other's systems off. So we, we hack Russia's water treatment facilities, their electric grid. They hack our water treatment facilities and their electric grid. And we all know we have access to each other. And we're like, well, we don't want to shut each other off because it impacts both of us. So it's kind of an arms race at this point on when the next thing happens around the types of capabilities that we're seeing out there. Um, and so hopefully, you know, it, it goes to a peaceful uh, type of thing. But we're all hacking each other uh, right now when it comes to it. Um, so that's the interesting part. And if you're doing business, must focus on, on security as a day-to-day -day thing. And, you know, as an industry, uh, we're growing. Uh, you know, I mentioned that, that hacker conference in, in Black Hat and uh, DEF CON in Vegas. That's been going on. When I started in, in the industry uh, in 2003, I was working for the military, and there was maybe 100 of us at this, this convention in Vegas. You know, it was a small group of hackers, a bunch of computer nerds. Um, literally, we looked like we were in, in our mom's basements. Um, 
you know, uh, in a hundred of us at this pool at a, a place called Alexis Park. And now it's taken over Caesars where we can't even fit any more people into the place because it's grown so big as an industry. So we have 20,000 plus hackers converging at Vegas once a year to share how we're collectively trying to uh, face what we're dealing with uh, out there today. Um, and there's all, also conferences literally happening every single day. I was at a security conference yesterday. I was working with some of the largest businesses here in New York City, um, helping them defend um, themselves against what's happening out there. We have a, a practice called hunt teaming going on and looking for hackers in your environments. And so those are the things that we're doing as an industry to try to get better, and people um, in this industry are really focusing hard on it. But it requires help. We need more folks. Uh, you know, uh, it's a great field. It's a growing field. It's something that, you know, I started my business uh, five years ago, and I have well over 200 employees uh, across the nation. Um, and I get to work with some of the largest companies you can possibly imagine because we're in so demand. Um, and that's one of the cool things about what we're dealing with is that it's not going to stop anytime soon, and technology is going to get better. We have to do something about it to protect our future. Okay, so we're going to segue to cybersecurity here at Iconic New York. And joining us now, we have David Kennedy, founder, CEO of Trustasec and Binary Defense. Thank you very much for having me on here. It's been a wonderful event. Good to see you. Yeah. I heard you were hilarious, and that's hard to find in the cybersecurity field. It is. There's not a lot of uh, folks that are personable and can hack into computer systems all day long. It's not the, the most exciting job, but uh, you know, we, we have some, some of us have social capabilities as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I heard your performance was, uh, was really engaging. Um, so well, let's talk about cybersecurity. I, it sounds so serious. What is happening right now in the world? You know, uh, we use technology in everything that we do. I mean, everything from implantable devices, you know, to pacemakers, uh, to what we wear on our phones, to, you know, the, the Internet of Things where we have, you know, uh, Nest thermostats and, you know, camera systems and even embedded in our cars. So technology is, is part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's not going to slow down anytime soon. And so with that comes security exposures, and, and hackers take advantage of it. Uh, we've seen a lot of boom in what we call ransomware attacks. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had the whole WannaCry scare, uh, where they shut down hospitals and other locations. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big pandemic right now, and hackers, both on organized crime, are making substantial amounts of money. I mean, you're talking billions and billions of dollars. This is a full-fledged industry. Uh, and taking advantage of companies and computer systems and having them pay for their systems, as well as uh, what we see from nation states. You know, Russia has been very active around the voting, obviously the voting issues with the DNC, uh, and what we see as far as attacking the United States. We're hacking each other all the time right now, and it's, it's a big pandemic across the entire world that we're seeing. And so, so you saw an opportunity to keep us safe on the Internet. That's right. You know, I, I started off my career uh, on the military intelligence side uh, and focusing on the cyber warfare capability pieces of it. And uh, I was uh, everything from a chief security officer to from from Diebold, uh, who makes the ATM machines, all the way to when I started, uh, you know, trusted second binary defense in my basement five years ago. And now we're a global company, you know, across the entire you know uh, entire world, uh, trying to stop hackers of what they do and help protect businesses and, and what they're actually going for. Okay, so it's not just hackers in basements. People that protect us on the internet also work in basements as well. That's absolutely right. And, and we're not all in basements. Uh, you know, surprisingly, we don't have hoodies and we don't hack in hoodies. Uh, you know, there's a, a whole series of, of hackers that are out there that are good, that fight for trying to protect the world against what's happening out there in technology and really trying to protect the risks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that is a, a desired skill. And, and it's, it's great because you have kids coming up with technology nowadays and they're just so fast at learning it um, that they naturally progress into security. And so we have a lot of really young folks. You know, it's a real you know, fun environment, Nerf guns and, you know, arcade games and things like that. Right. Um, but at the same time, we're doing a really important mission at trying to protect the world uh, and what's happening happening out there as far as hackers breaking into computer systems and stealing data. That's right. So I think you're our first cybersecurity guest today, first cybersecurity entrepreneur. In this day and age when you're trying to protect yourself and you know your private information, your credit card information, I would imagine there's a huge need for a company like yours. There is. You know, uh, and what people can uh, uh, hopefully understand is that the, the main reason why we're seeing these breaches today is because of us as humans. Mm -hmm. Humans are the number one target when it comes to all these breaches that you see in the news, when someone's stealing a credit card information. It usually um, comes down to one person opening up an email and clicking on a link that ends up hacking their computer and it becomes the downfall of an entire company. Right. And so with that, you know, um, humans being the weakest link, it, uh, you know, we're very busy at trying to help companies uh, educate their users, um, help them b build you know, security defenses to help them protect against those. So we're, we're in high demand right now uh, and we're hiring like crazy uh, and we continue to grow because this is something that's not going to slow down anytime soon. So why did you decide to start your own company? You know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I was a, a, a chief security officer, one of the youngest VPs uh, in Diebold history, uh, and I had a, a great job. Um, you know, I didn't have to worry about a thing. 
Um, but I, did, I felt like I wasn't uh, doing my part to help and fix uh, what's out there in security. And so I, I really, you know, it was, it was a perfect timing too. My wife uh, was pregnant with twins um, and I decided right now is the best time to go and start my own company uh, in the basement of my house, uh, you know, no funding or anything like that and, uh, and decided to leave and, and uh, try to help the world and, and protect themselves. And, uh, you know, we've, I've surrounded myself with, with uh, like-minded individuals. We have a whole team dedicated to um, trying to protect uh, the, uh, the country. And when WannaCry was happening, we were all up until, you know, six o'clock in the morning taking apart how it's working, trying to stop it, trying to combat it, get the information out there uh, to try to protect the world on when we saw you know, hospitals being shut down. So that's what we're here for. Okay, so when you're starting off a, a company like in cybersecurity, do you need to raise a lot of capital? Pro I would imagine not as much as other more capital intensive industries. Yeah, you know, the, the first company I started was Trusted Second. Consulting's, uh, you know, relatively easy. Not a lot of capital you need up front. Um, you know, you, it's, def, it's the person that they're buying at that point in time. So, you know, you have general costs like server infrastructures and, you know, IT stuff and things like that. Uh, marketing, legal, you know, some minor things, but not a, a ton of capital you need up front. Uh, where the capital comes into play is uh, we have a, a second company I started, and I did it in, in phases. Um, you know, Trusted Tech was first to get the capital I needed to be able to start my second company, uh, Binary Defense, and that requires a lot more because we have a 24/7 security operations center. We have hackers monitoring, you know, uh, other, you know, for other hackers breaking into our computer systems all the time. And we have software developers writing software and code to try to protect against hackers to protect our customers. So mm -hmm. that requires a lot more substantial investment, uh, you know, initially up front and as we go along. But uh, what's been nice is that uh, you know, first year starting Trusted Tech, profitable company. First year starting binary defense. Profitable, profitable in the first year. Profitable the first year. Profitable first year, and and then the second company. After all the investments that I put into it, profitable the second year. So we were profitable uh, in both companies the very first times. And I actually uh, also started a, a conference called DerbyCon, uh, which is now the second largest hacker conference in the country. So wow. all profitable uh, business ventures and things that uh, are help, uh, you know helping the community and helping the the, the world. Wow. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. I assume you've been approached many times for yep. someone to buy the company. Um, do you feel like it's time to sell yet? You know, uh, I don't get in. Uh, I get offers all the time, but it's not. I, I really enjoy what I'm doing right now, and I love every minute of it. I wake up, you know, going to work, you know, uh, singing to Justin Timberlake, and you know, in the world's, you know, uh, uh, flowers and everything. Uh, it's it's a great time for me. So I, I'm not interested in selling. Maybe that happens down down the road someday. Right. Uh, but right now, you know, we're making a huge impact on the industry. We're we're kicking butt and taking names, uh, and that's what we want to continue to go and do. Okay. So what are people asking you here at Iconic? You know, uh, you know, the the presentation was really neat because um, I was trying to show what happens out there um, in the real world. And I actually called somebody up on stage that I never met before, um, and I hacked into her personal information. I got her social security number, I got her uh, date of birth, her age, I got all of her family members, uh, their their driver's licenses, their locations. I got everything about them that you would you know consider. And I did it in about thirty seconds. Um, so I wanted to show what was actually possible. That's so scary. That is so scary. Okay. It is. Yeah. You know, but we put all of our information online, so you know it's easy to find that stuff for us as hackers. Um, for me, it's all about education around what's possible and what you can do to protect yourself, not just in business, but personally, um, things that you can do to protect yourself. And that's the most important message here, I think, at Iconic is, is to, to say, okay, we can do something to stop these hackers. We can do things in our business, and especially for entrepreneurs, small businesses, you know, they typically have much less security um, when it comes to what they're doing because they're, you know, it's, it's low budget, trying to get everything off the ground and, and keep things going. You can do it. Uh, you, if you're doing technology and business, you can do it. You can secure yourself. You just need to understand what the, the, the capabilities are of the hackers and how to protect yourself. Okay. Okay, so in 30 seconds, tell me, if I am a small business owner, I want to protect my business and my clients' information, what is the cheapest, most efficient way to do that? You can go to a lot of uh, cloud providers that provide security uh, in, in the actual process itself. Um, you know, things that, that are like, uh, um, when you go to encrypt things, it's already automatically encrypted. Uh, there, there's, there's providers that tout security uh, as part of it. So cloud can help you a lot when you don't have the um, stability to be able to build it in-house. If you're building in-house, you want to protect it. You want to um, have your, your um, computer systems designed to be in layers. So if one person gets hacked, it doesn't you know, um, cause the entire company to get hacked. So keeping information separate from different uh, roles within the company is very important. But most importantly, let's just stop clicking on things. You know, if you don't know where an email comes from, don't open it up. You don't need to look at it. You know, your Amazon package didn't get rerouted. Um, um, you know, there isn't a Nigerian prince, you know, that, that uh, wants to, you know, gift you a million dollars. Those are the things that we need to be careful of. So stop clicking on things is the biggest thing I could ever uh, emphasize to people in stopping these types of attacks because that's how they happen. Okay. Yeah. Well, David, you've been informative and scary at the same time. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. I appreciate it. And a uh, wonderful event. Iconic has been wonderful. <laughs> uh, great group here. So thanks. Yeah. Great, great to have you. Thank thanks. you again. David Kennedy, it. Trusted Sec. Okay. That was cybersecurity expert David Kennedy.
Yep, cybersecurity expert there, David Kennedy. So yeah, we are going to take a look now at the unique strategies for building a successful business from an earlier iconic panel that was moderated by CNBC's own John Ford. Tell us about the skills that you brought to this project coming in. You were a CPA, mm -hmm. uh, you had been to Harvard Business School, mm -hmm. and were kind of hunting for an idea mm -hmm. to be entrepreneurial. Uh, your parents? had been small business owners, you sort of grew up in that environment. What was your approach to entrepreneurialism? Did you always know that eventually you were going to be starting your own thing? I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't think I was going to be a water bottle entrepreneur per se, but I, I was always looking for an idea. But I think I was looking for such a big idea that, that would, it, it, I was never going to find it because it, it had to be this big aha moment. I was looking and searching. I never really thought it was going to just find me in, in a moment of you know, hiking and being thirsty as you know, the, the intro happened. So what to you was a big idea? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, a big idea is is is, is Mailchimp, right? Well, what, did, what, what did you? I mean, it doesn't. Seem, but a, none of these seem like big ideas. Yeah. I'm going to send people email for other people. Yeah. I mean, that, right? Yeah. So, what did you mm -hmm. think a big idea was going to be? Mm -hmm. The next Google, the next Facebook? Yeah, exactly. You know, some big platform, some big moment, some big change, change the world moment. I, I don't know that I I thought, you know, coming out of business school, that it could literally be. Uh, taking a product that already exists and making it work better, making it look better. You know, Swell is really fashion function philanthropy. Like we're a product that you know keeps things hot and cold. It has a, is a nicer outside and looks better. It gives back to a charity. It's it's a product that obviously has existed for a long time, mm -hmm. but we've been able to convert the non-converted. Like we we've been able to have customers actually collect our products because of the, the fact that we've got bigger ones that hold a bottle of wine or smaller ones that go in a lunchbox or fashion collaborations. It actually has turned into a big idea. But I think when I started the company, I didn't realize how big the market would be and for, you started for me. It with $30,000. Correct. Was that $30,000 you had in a special bank account marked for starting a business? Or was it there for something else and you had to rate it? To start this, when you had that epiphany idea, it was it was all that it, it was all that I had basically. <laughs> so um so I had a little bit of stock in in old in an old company and a little bit of savings. I was always very frugal, um, and basically said, you know, if this is something that I believe in, I should put my own my own sweat equity and my own time and money into this company. And that's instead of raising money, I decided to put my own savings into the company. But it was it was pretty much everything that I had at the time. Ben, couldn't you have grown faster? if you had taken other people's money? I mean, there's so many folks out there who say, oh, grow on other people's money. Why didn't you do that? It never occurred to me. <laughs> it honestly never freaking occurred to me. Uh, I, 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 excuse my language. Uh, you know, you I, don't have I, to I, ask for excuse for freaking. <laughs> I know you're from Atlanta, I, that's very nice, but. Uh, you know, I, I, I worked at a company, it was a great company, and uh, it, they started a dot com and it failed, and they offered us jobs. I said, no, thank you. This is a kick in the, in the pants that I need. I know that if I don't try to start my own company now, I never will. Hmm. They gave me a severance check, I got three grand. I used that to buy a business license and get started. Uh, but you know, uh, I, I went out and just knocked on doors and got a lot of paying customers to, to float my business the first couple of years. But once the business is a business, that's right. Once yep. you've got customers, yep. Yep. people will start offering you money for a piece of it. So even if it didn't occur to you, it probably started occurring to some other people. It did, but it was uh, it was when a competitor went public. That's when some some investors came knocking. Okay. And when it was, was clear that? to me that this is about uh, 07. Okay. It was clear to me that they just wanted to turn my business into the next company to go public and not allow me to run it the way that I wanted to run it and be authentic. Part of the authenticity of MailChimp is the level of benefits that you give to employees. 6% um, 401k match, I believe, and, and uh, a lot of other it's the, things. the maximum, it's 20%, 20 25%, I think. Oh, really? At the end of the year, yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, does that feed into why you wanted to maintain in independence, something about the culture of the company? And what advice would you have for others who are starting companies? Do you, do you bolt on those values later, or is it something that you sort of had from day one when you first started growing? I think everyone, every entrepreneur that I've ever met who start a company, they believe they're going to bring something unique and authentic, no matter what the, if it's a water bottle company, 
you know you're going to bring something unique to it. Uh, if it's an ice cream parlor, you know there's something unique and authentic you're going to bring to the table. It's after two years when 30% of small businesses fail. It's after five years when 50% of small businesses fail. You, you get that beaten out of you. Uh, but, but really, most entrepreneurs who make it, they're the ones who remember what it was that made them unique and authentic. And you're saying those values are part of that for you? That's right. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, I'm curious about you scaling. Mm -hmm. Because you went from, what, 10 million to 100 million in sales within a couple of years? Mm -hmm. um, doing that with an actual physical product that comes in as many different varieties as yours, I, I can't imagine how you did that without either taking on a lot of investment, which you haven't done, or a ton of debt. Mm -hmm. How, how? I mean, you're a CPA, so I'm sure that helped, but how did you manage to do that? It has been really helpful that I'm close to my numbers, that I really have to understand the ins and outs of the numbers. Um, it, it also has been an incredible ride of growth. Um, we have had some out of stock situations. Uh -huh. um, we've also had to be really careful about inventory planning because we do have maybe 100 or 150 different colors or patterns at any given time. So if you know a, a movie star happens to be carrying a hot pink bottle down the street, we have to make sure we have that bottle in stock. Um, but the, the scale and the growth of, of an actual physical product and the tangible nature of making it and selling it with the, the double and the tripling that we've had is, has been incredibly challenging. So but it's been fun. You got to 100 million in two years? Yes. I'm sorry, you're asking me a question. No, yeah. no, go ahead, chime in. Yeah. I mean, because that's you get 10 to 100 in, in 10 to 100 and not yeah. from zero to 100, but yeah. 10 to 100 in I can, two I can years, tell right? You, the, the hard part about it is we grew so fast and we didn't really have the infrastructure to keep up with it. So, you know, the analogy that we, we've been using internally is we've been sort of painting the plane after we took off. So we mm -hmm. didn't have the people, the process, the system. So we did 100 million in sales and we were still in QuickBooks and duct tape and Excel. <laughs> so um, the first quarter of this year, we launched an ERP system. We moved offices. We moved warehouses. We hired um, some more members of the executive team so we really did the infrastructure work that we probably should have done at 50 million out of a hundred wow. but we were just busy busy selling busy growing the business and who are you going to for advice either before this period mm -hmm. or during it mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to know to do those things um, so I don't have an official board of directors or an advisory board but I have more of an ad hoc um, group of uh, friends I would say entrepreneurs and um, there's people that I've sort of picked up along the way. Where uh, do you find friends like these who can help you scale from 10 to 100 million in 24 months? You know, I'm lucky. So you, you, you mentioned I went to Harvard for business school. Right. I've also been part of a couple really impactful women's programs. Um, I'm part of a women's program through Ernst & Young called EY Winning Women. Um, and I've met some great entrepreneurs there. Um, I've just sort of been lucky. I've been on I've been panels and just met people along the way. I've also found that if you just reach out to other entrepreneurs and just say, you know, I've, I've read your story. I'm in a similar situation. You know, let's share ideas. If we're not in competitive spaces, um, there's often times to idea exchange. And they point you to people who you should bring on board. Uh, great. Ben? Um, I just got off QuickBooks last year. <laughs> it's a great program. It's it nothing great. bad yeah, about it. There's, there's, it just it, there's a lot of tools that are missing. There's a lot of tools that are missing from an inventory yeah. planning perspective. That's what's great about controls so. and everything. Yeah, yeah right. So there's, yeah. there's ben, nothing bad about it. Anytime we call them, they'd be like, "We, we I, love yeah. you. I need, yeah. to, I need to take this. You might need to move back. off right. somehow. Yeah. We'll catch up later. Yes. So, so take this back. Just you know, we'll bring the people in. You have scaled as well in this environment where people keep on saying that email is dead, that it's all happening on social media. Um, what's been your strategy? I mean, you don't have a physical product to keep in inventory, which I guess is, is great. What's been your strategy for growing the business and growing employees at the same time, and yet keeping the amount of control that you feel you need to? I don't know that I have so much a strategy. We just sort of have an internal mantra, and it's listen hard, change fast. That's pretty much all you need to know about scaling a business, I think. So the listen hard is going out and visiting customers as much as you can and what do they need. Uh, and then you've got to keep your business structured so that it can change really fast. What does a customer visit look like for you? Uh, it, it looks like uh, getting on a plane. Oh, well, first, it, you look through your database to find a, a clump of customers you can talk to. Uh, last what one are you I looking for when you look uh, through the database? Somebody who's growing fast? You just somebody who's got... 
boop, okay, <laughs> Dayton, Ohio. Let me see how many I've got over there. Oh, 10, That's, that justifies a trip. You fly out and you go and you meet as many as you can and you just find out, hey, what does the MailChimp brand promise mean to you? What, what are we to you? And the last time I did that was in Dayton, Ohio, and they said, you're not email. You guys are all marketing. Please sprinkle the MailChimp magic pixie dust on all other channels. So that's why we've recently added more social channels even uh, to MailChimp. Um, is that not blasphemy when your name is MailChimp, not FaceChimp? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think if you get caught up in your own brand and you have your own perception, we talked a little bit about yeah. this backstage, it can seem like blasphemy. So the key is to get out there and visit your customers and ask them what does your brand mean to them. Tell me about space, just physical space. Yes. If you are starting a business and you're determined to be really efficient, really conservative about it, one of the first big expenditures, I guess, that you're going to have to make is a place to put it. That's right. Either that or you're going to do it out of your home. Yeah. How, how did you plan, okay, now is the time to get more space versus whatever you're working out of? At, at what stage did you move out of the living room? into an office space. My co-founder and I worked out of our apartments for the longest time and it just drove us insane working yeah. at home. You get cabin fever. Uh, and so we had to go out. I, I just drove around town. I remember walking into one place uh, and I realized I wasn't really out of my league. Like the lobby was all the way like a hundred feet to the reception desk. <laughs> and I realized, oh my God, this is like type A office space. I can't afford this. And eventually we started in like a, a 10 by 10 executive suite. That's all it takes. Yeah, it's the same. So I started Swell in my apartment, and yeah. then when I, a couple years in, I had to find my first employee. I moved into a one-person we work month to month space, but it was a yeah. one-person office. But I took out the desks and I put three little desks in there. <laughs> and then when we had more employees, so we got the little office next door, and then we had more employees, we got the next office next door, and then you know you just do what you have to do. But the space doesn't have to be the hard thing. It, you know, there's lots of these month to month situations all over the world now. Yeah. Do aesthetics matter, or are there enough other places where you can hold your official meetings that you don't need to have a beautiful space that costs a bunch of money? We never had customers visiting because we serve small businesses globally, so right. they just went online. Uh, and uh, we were always scared to death that someone would show up. Because yeah. <laughs> like, like Sarah, we just sort of... Uh, we were like cockroaches. We just hung on longer yeah. and all of the other tenants would fold their businesses and leave and we would just absorb their space. Yeah. And so our furniture was just really, really eclectic and weird. Yeah, I, I would agree. There's, there's plenty of beautiful places to have a, a nice meeting. Yeah. You can go, go, to the, go see the client or the yeah. customer or just do it in a hotel lobby. Do it in a, a really nice coffee shop. Yeah. I, I don't think that spending, yeah. if you're bootstrapped, if you're really thinking about where to spend, I wouldn't spend it on an a office. Yes, we are in the lunchtime break here at Iconic New York, but so much more to come in the afternoon lineup, and that includes a sit down with, I would call her a cosmetics mogul, Bobby Brown, and doing that sit down, that panel is Kimberly Weissel, Inc.'s editor at large, joining us yes. now. Good afternoon, so pleased to be here. Well, we're very excited as yeah. well. And uh, let me ask you about Bobby Brown. Are you excited yeah. for that? I'm complete, yes, I can't wait to speak with her. I spoke with her on the phone a little bit. I think she's gonna be great. Yeah, so yeah. the no makeup makeup trend that she started. I mean, there was makeup before Bobby Brown. I have a ton of respect for someone who can take a field that we think we know everything about, do something new, and sell hundreds of millions of dollars of products. I want to know all about how she did it. Right, and that's kind of that's kind of what Ink does, right? Well, you, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we look, it's a tired word, but we look for people who can disrupt an industry, right? Who can take something like Sarah Kaus, who was here earlier of Swell Water Bottles, we all had water bottles. We did. We didn't know we needed a $45 one until she came along. <laughs> right? Do we, need, do we need a $45 bottle? It's a $100 million company, yes. so <laughs> somebody does. And the smaller ones are 25 and I have one and I love it. Is that right. okay to say? That, so, that's okay. That's yeah, okay. it is. It's kind of um, cool. And, and also makeup. There was makeup before Bobby Brown absolutely, came along. Absolutely. Absolutely. And she was a freelance makeup stylist, right? Um, but she saw a need for something that was more natural looking maybe didn't send the message that you weren't good enough uh, how you are. Right. Built this company. She's left it now after 25 years, so it'll be great to see what's next for her. Okay, and what do you want to tell, what knowledge do you think the audience wants to hear from someone like 
as established as Bobby is. I mean, I think there are two things that people always want to hear about. One is, how do you keep your company culture as it grows? And two, how do you know when it's time to sell? And she had three offers before she actually took one, so I want to find out how she knew. Yeah, okay, well let's talk about Iconic here, Iconic yeah. New York, Midtown Manhattan. Yeah. Um, you know, what, you know you, you know, we're partners in this. Tell me, right. tell me what, what is it that we're doing here? You know, we are highlighting some of the most successful entrepreneurs and the people who advise them to try to help everyone in the audience build a smarter company to make better decisions day in and day out so they can have a strong company for the long haul. That's really what everything at Inc. is all about. And I think this um, joint venture between us, this conference really shows that. Yeah. Tell me, what, what are the top, I guess, top advice that people ask you for all the time? Well, what people ask me for, you probably get this too, is how to deal with the press. Right? That's what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Why? How would they do that? Uh, another big one is how do you talk about your funding yeah. and what kind of funding should you get? Because okay. there's a lot of coverage around sort of the venture capital bubble. It's not right for every company. So people often need a little help thinking through if they have the kind of company that should get institutional financing or if there are other things that they should consider. Yeah, and yeah. lots of bright ideas floating around here. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. lots of innovation. Yeah. I saw water bottles that you can't knock off tables. Oh, I mean. well, do you have toddlers? So I got to try it. You do. I have to try it. Yeah, that's great. And I love that people come up with the ideas that you didn't know you needed, and then you saw it, and you're like, this is brilliant. I have to have one. That's what entrepreneurship is about, I right. think. Making the world a little better idea by idea by idea. I think it's really a fun thing to cover. Okay, so you're the editor in charge at Ake Magazine. I love that. I'm actually the editor at large, but you <laughs> can call her editor, editor in, charge. in charge. That's good. Um, so, when you're covering fast-moving companies and yep. fast-growing companies yep. like this, compared to you know other lines of finance that you've covered in the yeah. past, uh, this is just way more fun. That's all there is to it because the variety is astounding, both in the industries and the people who are trying to change them, and the entrepreneurs generally. They're doing this from the heart. They're not quite so on message as big company CEOs. So if you have a real question, they can very often give you a real answer. You know, they're proud of what they know and they're proud to share it. Um, we hear a lot of great war stories and it just makes it a really fun job. Right. And right. we hope it's instructive for other people who are trying to follow in their path. Yeah, we had a really interesting conversation and you did with, uh, with our producer yeah. just now because covering finance, you know, there is this line that you, you have to really toe. I mean, you have to cover the company fairly, but then you can't really border on encouragement. At Inc.com, you know, is there is there such a line as well? Well, there is a line, but I think the difference is that we are supporters of entrepreneurship as a phenomenon, right? And we're not the only ones. I mean, this has, we've been covering this for more than 35 years, but more recently there's been a huge upsurge, especially among millennials and people who might otherwise retire or retire early and policymakers about what entrepreneurship has to bring to our culture and to our economy. So we could be 100% behind that and want to see individual companies do well without being like, go buy this stock or right. go buy this product. You know, we don't have to worry about going there. Right, and yeah. Yeah, can you congratulate on earnings calls? They don't have earnings calls yet. Once they have earnings calls, I'm probably not covering them, so I'm not congratulating anybody on those. Like, no, 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 we're not going back to that. No, thank you. No, it was fun, we're done. <laughs> Okay, so tell me, in all the years that you worked at Inc., um, you know, is there one company that stands out to you where you thought, wow, that was so inspirational. That was something I really enjoyed covering. That was a company that I saw before everybody else. So I will tell you a company that I love that is not like huge, huge, huge yet. Uh, it's called Rock Paper Robot. They make what they call kinetic furniture. It's furniture that moves. It's furniture that responds. Um, so you know how scary that sounds? So <laughs> it sounds it sounds scary, but the woman uh, who who has is running it has like the soul of an artist, and she got inspired when she saw a magic trick, and she's like, you know what? I know those things aren't floating, but we can make them look like they do. So she has a coffee table that the um, pieces of it look as though they're levitating, and it's a very effective optical illusion. So I love the idea of bringing beauty of using technology to bring beauty and surprise into right. things that we might think of as mundane. Yeah. So I'm hoping for huge things for her, 
Um, I just think they have some really creative pieces. Yeah, it's like installation art in your own Ex living room. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But, but there's a lot of tech behind it. Is it child friendly though? I mean, what about people with kids? Do they want a levitating coffee table? Well, it doesn't actually levitate. Okay. It's, it just looks like it does. Um, no, I would say it's probably not for like <laughs> your three and five year olds. Although some of the collapsing chairs definitely would entertain them for a long time. Okay. So it depends on which piece. All yeah. right. <laughs> Kimberly, thank you for dropping by. Thank you so much. And I look much. forward to your panel with Bobby Brown and just a bit. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that Kimberly just mentioned to us in our conversation was finding these companies who are in reinventing an already established industry. I mean, there are examples of that in the marketplace and yep. you know Kate Rogers also found a company that reinvented the friendship bracelet take a look Sarah Chips and Brooke Moreland <laughs> want to change the way young girls think and play I think that if we could start early and tell girls that they can be inventors and creators and builders um, it's going to change the world the co-founders of New York City based dual bots started selling their high-tech friendship bracelets in 2016 the bracelets pair with nearby friends, can send secret messages, and can be coded to change color. We uploaded the code to the jewel bot, and then it changed colors. When you're next to one of your friends, it like lights up. The idea was born out of an experience Chips had as a computer programmer surrounded by male colleagues. I was five years into my career before I worked with another woman, and it was another five years till I worked with another one, and so um, I really just always wanted to change that environment. The duo first launched their product on Kickstarter, meeting their $30,000 goal in one day. They graduated from Techstars in December 2015 and began retailing online on their own website and Target.com the following year, raising $1.3 million along the way. The hope is that more young girls will realize how fun coding can be. I think ultimately we don't want there to be a disparity between boys and girls in programming. We want just as many girls to program and get into the world of computer science and make that their career and design the products of the future. Okay, so later on this afternoon at Iconic New York, we're going to have a sit down with Damon John, founder of FUBU, also, of course, a shark in the Shark Tank. And in the past, we've had a few sharks visiting us at Iconic, including Robert Herjavic. I'm always a big believer in, you know, you can't change the past, but you have to acknowledge why you're here. And I'm sitting here because my dad made an incredible sacrifice to get me here. He didn't have to, he made that choice. And so I always felt that if I didn't do something with my life, like I had this feeling of destiny. The problem was I have no skill and I didn't know how to add value. And, but I had this incredible sense of desperation that if I didn't do something with my life, all the sacrifice wasn't worth it. And I didn't want to be rich. I mean, not that I have anything against money. I know Kevin was here today, so you guys, <laughs> you guys heard all about the goodness of money. And don't get me wrong, I like money as much as the next business person. But for me, it was always about doing something with my life and achieving some level of greatness. But I just didn't know what or how. So it's interesting, you know, the problem with a lot of people who are very technical and you know, to this day, and, and being on Shark Tank has really helped me with this. You know, when you sell very complicated technology, there's a real art form in simplifying it. So today, you know, I'm, I've been in the computer security business now for over 30 years, and I'm very technical, and I know this stuff inside out, but most of the time, it's not what I talk about. I talk about the benefits and I talk about the value. And so many of my competitors really struggle with that. Mm -hmm. You know, they go in, they talk about the widgets and it goes faster. And so you've got to be very clear about what you, what you sell and how to break it down. It's the art of simplicity in technology. Interesting. One of the things I learned in my early 20s, because I, I think good entrepreneurs are, are great observers of people. Because at the end of the day, sales is really about human interaction. And as I watched my friends graduating school and getting fancy jobs, 
One of the things I learned and saw was that they were changing fields. So they were in hardware doing sales, like you know tools at Black & Decker. And then they would get a job in retail and they were changing fields. And I noticed that people really want you to be great at a narrow subject matter. Go back and talk about the calculus of leaving the Huffington Post because it yes. does have your name on it. And that's the other piece of this, especially for serial entrepreneurs who build something. And it's even though they sometimes have great ideas, uh, things they want to pursue, they think it's very, you know, my name's on the door. And if I leave and the thing fails, what does that say? They still think it says something about them. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it would have been very, very hard to leave if I had not built an amazing team, uh, an amazing CEO. Uh, we have an amazing editor in chief in Lydia Paul Green who succeeded me. Uh, I think that was key knowing somehow that I was leaving my baby in great hands and it's turned out to be that way and I really um, believe that after all part of leadership is building great teams and that's becoming increasingly important and uh, and I had spent a lot of time doing that I had learned from my mistakes along okay, so the way. Biggest, biggest mistake in terms of choosing people because that's that is I think one of the great challenges that everybody faces how do you choose the right people? So I have this one rule, um, which I learned the hard way, which is no brilliant jerks allowed. No brilliant jerks allowed. Yes. What about, what about dumb jerks? No dumb jerks either, but the, that's easy. The no dumb jerks rule is easy. We all have it. The harder rule is no brilliant jerks. And often, you know, you come across people who are brilliant, who you know are going to be great, but you know they're going to be toxic for the culture. And I have an absolute rule, which is no, don't go there. And if you go there by mistake, fire them as fast as possible. And uh, the truth is there is nothing worse for a culture than quote unquote top performers who are um, really undermining their colleagues, who are creating an atmosphere where people can't be their best, they can't create, they can't build teams. So you said you learned the hard way. You don't have to name names, but, but tell us the story. <laughs> so really, um, there was a moment when I realized that someone who was um, really good at her job was incredibly toxic, where I had people coming up to me complaining about how undermined they were. Um, and it was a very hard decision because he was very good. So or she do, was very good. How do you I'm not giving a pronoun. How do you identify that in advance? Meaning there's some people who are great at, you know, they're great at the interview. They're great at, the, I've, I've done it, I've, I've, I've made the mistake many a times. You, you, you have the job interview, they, they seem like the perfect person, and oftentimes you know pretty soon whether you made the mistake. Yes. The mistake is usually relatively obvious, but in this case, was that obvious? Well, I'll tell you how you identified um, earlier. What I do now during interviews, I say, listen, I want to tell you there is something that I'm completely allergic to, I said, nobody likes it, but I'm completely allergic to it, and this is passive aggressive people. So I said, I give you complete permission, and this is at any level of the organization, because at the Huffington Post, where we ended up being about 900 people before I left, and at Thrive Global, where we are now 75 people, I interview everybody. So my, this is, a, this is a, a speech I give to everybody, which is, I give you full permission to walk into my office and scream at me if you're unhappy, if I did something you don't like. But I want you to consider this as your last warning if instead you go and complain about me or any of your colleagues behind their back. I want a completely transparent culture. If, if you're working with Andrew and you're upset with Andrew, I want you to go and talk with An to Andrew. If you want somebody to help mediate you, we have a team of people who can help and talk with you and Andrew. But I think the most toxic thing is I'm upset with Andrew, but instead of coming to you, I go to 10 people behind you and complain about Andrew. This is, this is the way to destroy a company very, very quickly. And so I, I give that speech at the beginning, and it does make a difference. You begin to you see how people react. Do you have a favorite job interview question? You know, I always want to know what do people want to do in five years because it, it shows, you know, where their heart is and do they see this job as a stepping stone? Okay, this one's hard. 
you have a very high profile. All right, so let's talk to Inc.com's president and editor-in-chief, what we are so happy to have with us now, Eric Schoenberg. Nice to be here. Wow, so look at this, you know, hundreds of people here today in Midtown Manhattan. You know, did you think Iconic would turn into the success that it is? Oh, yes, I always knew it would. I mean, <laughs> the combination of a couple of great brands in Inc. and CNBC, and a topic that is really important, important to the people who come here and important to the economy. Entrepreneurship yeah. is the engine that drives innovation and job creation and on the part of the entrepreneurs creates self-fulfillment and you know a kind of feeling of accomplishment they just can't get anywhere else in business right and so tell me about this you know the iconic events how did you guys brainstorm and and realize that people needed this well inc was after a particular sponsor who wanted a uh, bigger scale than inc would provide all by itself and inc had an events business and we were thinking who do we know who has a lot of scale? And I was thinking, well, I went through my list of friends. And those friends included Nick Diogan, uh -huh. uh, news director at CNBC, and Tyler Matheson, uh, of uh, the co-anchor of Power Lunch. And I thought, well, those guys have scale, and we have events, and they're interested in entrepreneurship, and right. we love entrepreneurs. And out of that, a happy marriage was made, and that sponsor, it's the sponsor you see all over here at the New <laughs> like, World Stadium. Really? Where? I couldn't <laughs> yeah. miss the signs. It's the iconic symbol, T-Mobile. That's right. Okay, so tell me about um, what you're hearing from the attendees at these iconic events, because I feel like it grows and grows each and every year. Well, a lot of people are repeat customers, which is a great thing. That's a really great endorsement. So people are coming up to me and saying, you remember me from you know, the iconic tour in Chicago or Seattle? and. I go, yeah, sure, I remember you. And they say, this is the best one of all. And I got on this many tips, or I did this amount of business, or I got to buttonhole you know, this famous entrepreneur and get their advice. So a lot of it is about you know, be getting up close and personal with your business heroes. A lot of it is about networking with other entrepreneurs. Some of it is about you know, buttonholing people like you or the ink entrepreneurs and being able to tell their story to a real live journalist. Right, and trying to get your attention as well. Maybe uh, yeah, get on CNBC or get a story in ink. <laughs> now, okay, so basically here, is it the key is networking. Is that what they're looking for? Are they looking for investors as well? Yeah, they're looking for investors. They're looking for people who can give them tips about how to run their business. They're looking for vendors. They're looking for um, people who understand what they're going through. So people that can just roll their eyes about over regulations, about taxes, about how hard it is to find good employees, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, do you feel that the entrepreneurial spirit, maybe it's all, it's been there, obviously, America's mm -hmm. built on uh, entrepreneurship, but do you feel like it's scales in the last few years? It's really caught on. Oh, it's changed tremendously. When Inc. started, when some of the people who will be on stage, the real hero entrepreneurs, got started in their business, entrepreneurship meant the guy who set your house on fire and then sold you a hose. It was, they were, they were, it was, it, it meant you couldn't get a real job. That's what being an entrepreneur meant. And now, rightly so, belatedly, I would say, people recognize entrepreneurs as the heroes of the economy that they really are. Right. What do you think has changed at Silicon Valley, the dot com boom? Uh, well, I think that's part of it. So people are getting rich, um, starting companies in a way they never could before technology really scaled things like that. Although people, of course, did, but it took longer. Um, but I also think there's just a recognition. Uh, the idea that entrepreneurs are job creators has acquired a lot of um, a lot of currency, I would say, in the past five to 10 years. And that's made a big difference. And people now recognize that this is where the rubber meets the road in a free enterprise economy. Right. Well, you're set to take the stage later on, Eric. You're speaking to Steve Handy of Brooklyn Brewery. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, typically when people come up to you at Iconic, what, what's some of the advice that they're, they usually ask you that they're looking for? Well, they're looking to tell me their story uh, and get it in ink. So that's one of the things. So, and every entrepreneur who's been around a while has a remarkable story. That's just kind of the nature of it. It's hard. Um, there's always some kind of near-death experience with your business where right. you, and there's always some kind of clever pivot that you make that helps you turn the corner. Um, and there's always a sense of accomplishment, a sense of mission fulfilled when you really do succeed. So the stories are pretty good. 
advice that people are looking for, it's about where to get financing. That is a major roadblock for companies that are starting up. Um, and often, it's also about people. That's the other thing that entrepreneurs tell us is the hardest thing in their business, finding the right employee for the right job. Right, uh, and we spoke, spoke to Flywheel CEO Sarah O'Hagan yeah. earlier on. She's great, great advice, right? Yeah, she's wonderful. Um, and one of the, I think the biggest piece of advice and the most poignant piece of advice I took away was you have to lean into failure. Yes. Don't be afraid to fail. There is um, there's an academic study by a, a, an academic out of Stanford called Carol Dweck is her name. I don't know if you've, you've heard of her. And she distinguishes between two mindsets, the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. And the key distinction between these two ways of thinking are how you deal with failure. Fixed mindset sees failure as an indictment of you. Right. I am a failure. I can't do this. I guess I'm no good at this. I won't try again. The growth mindset says, all right, I failed. I'll try something different. I'll try it again. It's just a learning experience. You don't personalize it. You don't think it's permanent. Right. And you don't think it pervades everything else in your life. And if you've got that mindset, you're halfway to being a successful entrepreneur. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.